your future. I can't wait to hear your thoughts. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rob. Now I'd like to introduce another Rob, uh, Dr. Rob Evans, Interim Vice President for Academic Programs and Dean here at the Wilson Oceanographic Institution. Thank you. I, I don't have too many words because it's not me you want to hear from. We want to hear from all of you today. So I hope you have all had a wonderful summer. I hope you've all learned not only science, but about yourselves. You teach us as much as we teach you, right? We are really invested in having Bui and the Wutol community be a more inclusive community. So we learn a lot from your presence here and thank you for that. I am gonna thank all of the people behind the scenes. There's a lot of work that goes into this program. I think you probably recognize that having been here for the, for, for the summer. But um, let's maybe give a hand to all of the people that have uh, really pulled this off for you. Um, so I don't have much more. I'm really looking forward to hearing your talks. Um, uh, wherever, you, wherever you go from here, I hope this summer has connected you not only to science, but to new friends. They will stay with you. I can almost guarantee that for the rest of your careers. And um, thank you for thank you for being here. Thanks, Rob. And now the real fun begins. So, a couple of things for you students. Please remember to talk into the microphone. So, standing anywhere around here, the people on Zoom aren't going to be able to hear you if you walk too far. And you do have a laser pointer up here. So it's this thing here, I'll leave next to the computer. There's a little red light and you should be able to point to anything you'd like on the screen. I'm gonna be sitting over here in the back. So when you're up here, I'll be on your left. When you get to 13 minutes, I'll give you a gentle wave. When you get to 14 minutes, I'll give you a bigger wave. And at 15 minutes, I will start to walk towards the podium. We wanna make sure that we stay as on time as possible and be respectful of each other. So everybody take a deep breath. Do your best. We are all here to support you. Everyone in this room, everyone who's watching on Zoom, we know you guys did a lot of work this summer. You guys have been getting awesome presentations. Just do your best and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. I will bring up our first presentation. And our first presentation is Esmeralda Garcia. Um, yeah. Hello, my name is Esmeralda Garcia, and I'm a senior at the College of Holy Cross in Western Massachusetts. And this summer, um, I had the privilege to work with the Witzel Oceanographic Institution in the Subash Lab. Um, studying Jeffrey Ocapsa Oceanica's physiological response to aquatic enhancement in laboratorial cultures. Okay, so first things first, uh, the ocean plays a vital role in regulating our atmospheric CO2 concentration. <coughs> the ocean can store more than 50 times as much carbon as the atmosphere and absorbs approximately 30% of overall carbon emissions. However, the threshold of the ocean's um, Carbon dioxide intake is limited and cannot counteract the rapid increase of carbon emissions that we are seeing today. Um, so in this graph right here provided by the um, our world in data shows that each year we are seeing record breaking numbers of CO2 emissions. And as a result of uh, this rapid increase of carbon emissions, the ocean is absorbing more and more CO2 um, than it can handle, which is causing a reduction in pH levels. Um, which is essentially ocean acidification. So therefore there's an urgent need for, um, for CO2 removal and emission reductions um, in, order, in order to combat climate change. 
So ocean ability enhancement, or OEE, is the most promising method in reducing atmospheric CO2. Accolade is essentially um, the buffer capacity of seawater to take in CO2 and um, maintain a constant and healthy pH level. Uh, so in order to illustrate the positive effects that OE has in the ocean, um, this graph right here shows the um, benefits that it has. So on the x-axis, we have alkalinity. In the y-axis, we have dissolved and organic carbon species with a gradient of partial pressure CO2. And as you can see, as more alkalinity is added, more CO2 can be sequestered, which in turn decreases PCO2 in DIC. Um, while ocean ethylene enhancement is the most promising um, carbon removal strategy, the biological impacts of OEE is not yet fully understood. So the purpose of my research is to see um, how OEE affects the growth, classification, um, and overall health of Jeffrey Ocapsa oceanica, which is the second most abundant copolithophore species. And just to show how abundant copolithophores coco are in general, this is a bloom of them off the coast of the Gulf of Maine. Um, so right, right over there, you can see Cape Cod. And this bloom can be seen from space, which is remarkable considering that coccolithophores are tiny, tiny species that have the width of two microns. Um, and to ascend, and coccolithophores are the most um, abundant calcifying phytoplankton in general and play a vital role in the carbon cycle as they take up CO2 through photosynthesis and consume alkalinity through their calcium carbonate shells. And so if my research shows that there is little, that OEE has little to no effect on the oceanica, um, advances for OEE can be more readily supported and funded. So my survey had three treatment groups for the oceanica. All treatments were done in filtered um, modified seawater. So my first treatment was to control, which had no activity added to it in order to serve as a reference um, of normal growth in the oceanica. My second treatment was an equilibrium treatment, which received um, an alkalinity added of about 500 micromoles per kilogram of sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is a mineral source for alkalinity. And the equilibrium treatment was not equilibrated with CO2 in order to simulate the immediate effects of OAE um, in the ocean. And my final treatment was the equilibrium treatment, which received the same amount of alkalinity as the second treatment. Um, but the equilibrium treatment was bubbled with, atmos uh, with atmospheric PCO2 in order to replicate the effects of OEE in the ocean after some time has passed. So once again, um, just to uh, reiterate what, my, uh, what these treatments do, we're essentially trying to replicate OEE's effects in the ocean. So the control is, okay. Sorry. The control is um, no alkalinity added. The uh, equilibrium treatment is when alkalinity is immediately added. And then the equilibrium treatment is when the CO2 sequestration has begun in the ocean. And so the oceanica were then placed in cultures with these treatments. And once these cultures reach their exponential growth, we then transfer them into new cultures. And um, new cultures after transfer were documented as a new generation. And over the course of the summer, I was able to have five generations of each treatment. And so um, geoceanica's physiological response to um, ethylene enhancement were measured mainly by growth rates, classification rates, and photosynthetic efficiency. And each measurement was done after a transfer um, had occurred. So each culture was measured daily for their cell concentrations via flow cytometry. Um, and the averages of these growth rates were uh, then plotted onto this uh, box plot. So in the x-axis, we have the treatment names. In the y-axis, we have growth rates. And as we can see, there was no significant difference in um, any of the treatments. There was no treatment that outperformed, underperformed compared to the other ones. And just to reaffirm that there was no differences between these two, we um, calculated the averages and standard deviations of all treatments. And they were all relatively in the same range, and therefore we could conclude that growth rates was not affected by alkalinity enhancement. So classification rates were also oh, over the course of the summer. We conducted four classification rates. Classification rates were measured um, via a 13C tracing method that was developed in our lab. And 13C tracing allows us to measure how quickly G oceanica is building their shells. So similar to growth rates. All three treatments had relatively uh, 
the same ranges. So on the x axis, we have treatment names. In the y axis, we have classification rates. And the averages and standard deviations were also relatively in the same range. And so, therefore, we could conclude that classification rates were not um, impacted by equity enhancement. Um, so, we also conducted photosynthetic efficiency, and that was measured via fire FV over FM instrumentation. FV over FM is a ratio of variable fluorescence over maximum fluorescence, and it's an indicator of photosynthetic performance. So over the course of a day, we did an hourly time series of each of these treatments. And the data from this time series was then plotted onto a scatter plot with the X axis being the time and the Y axis being FV over FM. And um, all three treatments had a consistent FV over FM over the course of the day. And so therefore, um, this indicates that photosynthetic efficiency is not impacted by ethylene enhancement. Cellular particulate um, inorganic carbon quota can tell us the amount of calcium carbonate that Geoceanica uses to build their shells. Then by comparing these three, these three treatments, we can get an idea if Geoceanica is um, calcified more or less. And so once again, we have the X axis being the treatment names and the Y axis being the PIC quota. And once again, we can see that there is relatively no significant difference in um, any of the three treatments. And once again, the averages and standard deviations for in the we're relatively in the same range. And so therefore we can conclude that PIC quota is not affected by athlete enhancement. So scanning electron microscopy or SEM is a high resolution 3D image microscope. Photos on this instrument are taken at the micrometer scale. And for our later generation, we were able to use an SEM from MBL um, to take pictures of our latest generation's focolithophores. Um, and each picture um, for the cogolithophores were taken at the two micron scale, uh, which is essentially the width of a single spiderweb strand. So it's very tiny pictures. Um, so here is a cogolithophore from our control treatment. Here's one from our equilibrium treatment, one from our unequilibrium treatment. Now here's a zoomed in picture of a cogolith in the in the control control, well, in the control treatment. Um, Cogoliths are the plates that encompass the shells. Now here's one from the equilibrium treatment and one from the unequilibrium treatment. Um, so SEM has allowed us to visually conclude that G-Ocean, G-Oceanica, um, G-Oceanica's morphology um, is not impacted by accolade enhancement. And so last summer, a former PEP student, Aaron McDonald, ran similar experiments as me, but with the cocolithophore Emiliana Huxii. So on the top is my, um, my, my growth rates, PIC quota, and classification rates. On the bottom are his uh, growth rates, PIC quota, and classification rates. And by testing the two most abundant cocolithophores, we can get a better idea as to how OE will have these important classifiers. And so essentially, similar to me, he also saw no significant difference in any of his treatments. But while our laboratorial experiments indicate that OE has little to no impact on these two cocolithophore subspecies, Further research must be done, such as field trials, in order to see how OEE affects um, species in the open ocean, as well as how OEE impacts other important phytoplankton and at higher alkalinity levels um, over, a longer, over a longer period of time. So I'd like to thank everyone in the Subash lab, Adam, Chloe, Mohammed, Matt, Lucas, Emily, and Yasmin. I'd also like to thank Matt Johnson for allowing us to use his instrumentation while ours was overseas. I would also like to thank Aaron McDonald for providing his previous summer research on eHubCI. And finally, I'd like to thank the PEP program for granting me this opportunity to, go, to conduct research here this summer. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> yes. Um, I'm wondering what's the next step of this information? Is there a third report that you would be interested in doing research on? Or what would we think of trials out in the world would look like? What do you think would be the next step? So we actually have next steps to do field trials. I know in my lab particularly, um, there's gonna be three um, three uh, like boat cruises are gonna do that they're actually gonna um, like dump like 
So I'm like nine miles into the ocean to see the effects of OE in the open ocean. Um, I know right now they are getting ready and like practicing it and practicing um, dumping some of the dyes and stuff. So it's definitely uh, currently underway. I and mean, I know there have been talks about kind of seeing how, uh, or seeing the effects of higher economy. So right now we're just adding 500 micromoles per kilograms. But I know they're talking about adding um, even more, like believe in the thousands, and seeing how those are affected in the lab. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Great talk. I really enjoyed it. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, so you were looking at uh, what OAE would do uh, to current ocean conditions and pH um, on the Coquitlam report, but I was wondering if you have any predictions about uh, what your results would show if you did it with a, a more acidified ocean condition. So there's a greater difference between uh, what, you, what you're starting with and then what you're adding to with alkaline. Yeah, I definitely think that um, if there's more acidification, there definitely should we definitely should look at more like a higher alkalinity concentrations just to see if that could counteract it more. Um, if further, I think we need to see the effects of ocean acidification on like other regions to see how um, so like minerals used for alkalinity can impact those. Thank you. Our next presenter will be Mr. Avion Brown. Good morning, Cupsters. Good morning, mentors. My name is Avion Brown, and this summer I had the privilege of working with, with Ms. Kathleen Savage on my project, Potential Methane Oxidation Rates in Highland Research Forest Soils. So here's just a little bit about me. I'm a rising junior at the Tennessee State University. I'm an environmental science major. And in my free time, I spend time down at the wetland alongside Dr. Bile of the USGS. Some of the things we do there, we just measure nutrient levels, nitrogen, phosphorus, check for harmful algal blooms. The wetland is on our school's farm, so it plays a vital role in that ecosystem. So I just wanna make sure it's looking good, things of that nature. So here are the basics. Everybody knows climate change is occurring. It's happening right now as we speak. Everybody knows about carbon dioxide, but it's other family member of the greenhouse gases. Methane doesn't get as much attention. So methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. And methane is contributing to global warming, even though it's only a very small component of the atmosphere. The concentration has been steadily increasing for the past couple of decades. And unlike CO2, where we have protocols in place, we have things that we do, things that we know that we can, steps that we can take. 
to kind of sequester and mitigate our impact, we don't really have that same, those same protocols in place for methane. So we're gonna need some help. Enter Highland Forest. Highland Forest is a sub royal forest in Northern Maine, and it's a forest mostly consisting of red spruce trees. Temperatures in this forest range from negative 13 degrees Celsius to about 26 degrees Celsius in the summer. When we went up there, me and my roommates, thank you to you guys for coming along. The temperature got a little bit higher than that, so these are just rough averages. So basics. This is a conceptual diagram of Highland Forest, and I'm gonna give y'all like 10 seconds to take it all in. I know we got visual learners, so. So first we got the wetlands. And in the wetlands, you see a large population of these brown stars right here. What these are are methanogens. Methanogens release methane under the conditions that they like. And the conditions that they like are saturated anaerobic conditions. That means you're not having too much oxygen present in this area is wet. Next population you got are right here, the methanotropes. Methanotropes, what they will do is, in the presence of oxygen, they will sequester or take in methane. And these guys, they like unsaturated aerobic upland areas. That's why you see such a large population here. And in the middle, you got a very important place, the transitional area. As you see here in the transitional area, you have both methanogens and methanotrophs. Depending on the soil moisture status, the methanogens may dominate the methanotrophs if the soil is wet, not very inundated, not very porous, you can't really get too much oxygen in there. But when the soils are drier, porous, you can get some oxygen flow, the methanotrophs will dominate the methanogens, and the methanotrophs will be sequestering in methane instead of the methanogens sequestering out methane. So my project, what I was focused on with the methanotrophs and methanotrophic activity, and how do they work? This tower up here is called an eddy covariance tower. And what it does is it measures the net flux of the whole forest for carbon dioxide and methane. So my objective was to determine methanotrophic activity across the soil drainage gradient and down through the soil profile. So what I wanted to see was, okay, how do the methanotropes act from here to here? What's the difference between the ones in the wetland, the transitional and the upland? And what's the difference between the ones, and as we know, there's different layers of soil. So how do these soil layers act? How does this one act? How does this one act? This is in order to find out where the greatest rates of oxidation occur so we can better understand methanotropic activity. Under future climate change, how they may become a net source of methane instead of a net sink, which it is now. So these are my methods of collection. So the first thing that I had to do when I got up there was identify the soil drainage class that I was in. The upland is not pictured, but the upland was characterized by dry soils, you had dead leaves, dead cones, things of that nature on the ground. The transitional area, which is pictured here, it was characterized by a lot of greenery, lush, you know, things of that nature, it was grass down there. The footing was kind of firm, kind of moist, you know. And then finally, the wetland area, which is characterized by this sphagnum moss right here. That let me know I was in the wetland and my wet socks let me know I was in the wetland. <laughs> so, yeah. After I identified where I was at, my next job was to prepare the area. That just looked like cleaning off any leaves, plants, insects. I wanted to know what the soil was doing, not the overall ecosystem. So I prepared the area. After that, I used the soil probe found right here. I would stick it in the ground, give it a whiz, give it a wiggle, give it a twist, a whirl, pull it out, extract the sample. After that, I would divide and separate the sample by soil horizon. Here you see the OM layer, here you see the A layer. How I would know which layer I was looking at was, as you can see, there's a color difference, there's a texture difference. After that, I would collect and bag the samples up for testing. This slide is just a reiterating the soil horizon. So first you see the OM. The OM layer is the organic top layer. You, got, you see the accumulation of dead and decaying matter in this layer and high microbial activity. The next layer down, the A layer, is dominated by weather pair material characterized by the accumulation of organic matter. And that's what kind of gives it this darker looking color. Finally, the AE layer is characterized by its lighter color 
minerals have been leached into lower levels and less nutrients are there for plant growth. That's why I got this spider color, no nutrients there, not too much microbial activity taking place in that way. So after I collected my samples, I took it into the shack for testing. The first thing I had to do was homogenize the soil sample. What that looked like was I had it in a bag, I would shake it, mush it, put it all together because I wanted to get a total look at that total soil sample, not just the top or the bottom of it. So I would homogenize it and put it all together. Next thing I had to do was standardize the weight, scoop it out of the bag. I wanted about 10 grams, put it on the balance, see where it was. After that, I would place it in the control chamber. Control chamber is seen up here. All it is is a mason jar, nothing too fancy. Um, checking for leakage. So you see, I got this data right here. It's hooked up to a computer in the back. You can't really see it. It's called a light core. And what this will do is show me methane concentrations and carbon concentrations. So in order to make sure there's no outside influence on my chamber, I will give it a little blow, make sure the carbon didn't jump, because as you know, we release carbon when we breathe. After that, I will aerate the jar with this device here. What that will do, it will spray oxygen into the chamber. This would isolate methanotrophic activity. I didn't really want the methanogens doing too much, so spraying it with oxygen will have the methanogens die down, not do as much work, and the methanotrophs activate and do what they need to do. After that, I will spike the chamber with methane, two different concentrations. So on this device, I will get a graph as well. I will see a spike. I wasn't really looking at the spike. I was looking at the subsequent downward slope that would come after. And that would let me know how fast and at what rate was the soil pulling methane out of the atmosphere. After that, I collected the data and replaced the soil in the bag. And I, I took it to Woodwell so I could put it in the scientific oven and dry it and get the dry weight of it. And that was just to help standardize the data because as you know, some of the soil was wet, some of the soil had different things. So I just wanted to dry it down and get a better look. My results. So I was kind of surprised by, by my results. The transitional areas were actually the best at oxidating, oxidizing methane. I suspect this is because the transitional areas are prone to being exposed to lots of methane as it can sometimes be a sink and at other times be a source. So like I said earlier, Sometimes if the methanogen population is dominating the methanotrophic population, that area is gonna have a lot of methane. Then next, the A layer was better at oxidizing lower concentrations of methane, whereas the organic layer is better at oxidizing higher concentrations of methane. That made a lot of sense to me as the organic layer is more exposed to the atmosphere, so it's used to having and being exposed to more high, higher concentrations of methane, whereas the A layer is dealing with some of the concentrations that has already been pulled out by the OM layer. So that made sense to me. And this is just another way to visualize the data. And as, as you can see here, on the x-axis, I got drainage class. And on the y-axis, I got methane per gram of dry weight. And yeah, so on this one, they were grouped by drainage class up top and the x-axis was soil horizon. And on this one, they're grouped by Soil layer. So, discussion conclusion Howland is a net methane sink. Transitional areas have the potential to take in near as much methane as upland areas. But as the climate changes, the environment high and forest will change significantly. The warmer and wetter conditions will potentially lead to the increase of wetland areas where methane and genes dry, thrive. Transitional areas may become wetlands, and in the future, Howland may become a net methane source. So overall, what I just wanted to say was, it's just a self-perpetuating cycle. As climate changes, you're gonna get wetter and warmer conditions. Wetter and warmer conditions are gonna to lead to more wetland area and howling. So even if it's just a small piece of the puzzle, we just gotta be proactive and be mindful of what we do. Thank you, that's my talk. For my acknowledgments, I want to say thank you to Anji, Dr. Gerald Pelt, just for letting me have this opportunity. Thank you to Monet, best pep coordinator I can ask for. You were a mentor, a friend, a peer, a ear, a shoulder. You meant a lot to all of us. And then finally, I want to thank my mentor in the back, Ms. Kathleen Savage. She was awesome. She was great. A bundle of knowledge, very patient. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
I collected 27 in total. Yes. Too many. This man. Um, this question, um, this question, but how did you differentiate microbial activity between the different layers of the soil and you homogenized it? Oh, well, um, when I homogenized it, I only homogenized a certain samples of that uh, certain layer. Oh. So, yeah, when I took the OM layer, I was just homogenizing with the OM layer. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. This question is super cool. Thank you. I'm curious, are the results going to be used in the form? Management strategies in the forest? Um, so what I did was only one part of the whole thing. I did the methanotrophic side. So once we get more info on the methanogenic side, then yeah, it'll probably be used for something. I'm curious, uh, for your initial analysis that you said you did, and I think the shack, was that a whole mobile lab that you had to bring up and set up there? No, it wasn't a mobile lab, but it was a shack. It was pretty cool. To, to <laughs> see it All right, sis. So I guess, like, how will this research continue? So how will this research continue? I don't know. Maybe I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah. I did the methanotropes and the methanogens still haven't really been studied. So what I studied was how, what the methane, methane has two main microbes, methanotropes and methanogens. I studied the ones that take in methane. And what, other, what needs to still be studied is how is it getting released and how much do the other ones release? So, yeah. yeah. Did you learn something new here that you can take back to Tom Bile and say, hey, maybe we should try this? I would say a lot. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. <laughs> your uh, your chamber is CO2 as well, right? Yes, sir. So did you did you look at the, the production of CO2? No, I was focused mainly on methane. Okay. Yep. Our next speaker is Miss Lauren Stevenson. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad I got a response. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today, oh, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Lauren Stevenson, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about understanding the effect of salinity on green crabs in biochemical pathways. Throughout this process, my mentors have been Carolyn and Yamini. I want to thank them before I even start because I would not have been able to do any of this without their help. I definitely would have been lost. <laughs> Now, first, I want to start with just green crabs in general. So their actual name is Crassinus minus. They are an invasive species, which just means that they can tolerate many different environments with different temperatures and salinities. If you look at the map on the right, you can see that the blue area in Europe, that is their native range. But in the 1800s, they moved over to the east coast of the United States. But after the 1800s, they made their way over to California in about the 1990s. And then just a year ago, they were found in Alaska, which is a pretty big deal because all of these areas are different temperatures and different salinities. So it's a wide array of things that they conform to. They're also an R selective species, which just means that they reproduce very fast and there's a lot of them. So they also have a lack of natural predators in the invasive range, which means that if they're reproducing at that fast rate, 
rates, nothing is there to checkmate them. So they can limit the amount of green crops there. They can also tolerate many different environments, like I said, with um, different temperatures and salinities around. And they do this with osmoregulation. Osmoregulation is the process of balancing water and solutes. In this case, the solute would be salt. I know these look like blood cells, just imagine that they're gills right now. <laughs> <laughs> so in the hypertonic solution that they would be in, if you look down closer to the bottom, that means that a lot of water is leaving. There's not that much water in that gill. So it means that a lot of salt is in it. So it's very dehydrated. But if you look over to the hypotonic, that means a lot of water is in it, which means that there's less salt in that gill. And if they don't osmoregulate correctly in the environments that they're placed in, that essentially means that they could pop from the inside out like a balloon. And we don't want crab balloons. <laughs> So I had to do some past research before I could actually make my experiment. And so I looked at the Rivera Ingram project. They actually had a sister species that they ran a study on and it was the Carcinus estriae. And I learned that in the posterior gill that contained the osmoregulatory function. And I'm gonna get more into that later in the talk, why that's important. So, and I also learned that the exposure to dilute salt water was the most challenging condition for this crab species. So it was elevating their respirations rates. So that led me to think that salinity will have an effect on green crab physiological function and metabolism. Now, the way that my experiment was set up, my little crabbies up here, they were in three different solutions. In those three different solutions, there were three tanks. Five crabs were in each tank, which means that we had 15 crabs per solution. And through this process, we had to make these um, salt seawater. So in that process, we did the, we inserted instant ocean inside the water to make this different solutions. Um, the 47 obviously had to have more instant wash, instant ocean in there, but the diluted water didn't have that much. So we also recorded the time to write and heart rates taken before. So these crabs were acclimated to 32 parts per thousand for three days. And after that acclimation, they were placed in their new salinities, the 10, 32, and 47. Now you're probably wondering why 32? That's actually a normal seawater for these crabs. So they're not changing drastically. And then after about five days of the acclimation to their new salinities, they, um, their time to write and heart rates were taken once again. And once everything was taken, unfortunately, we had to do some crab surgeries or, yeah, so they kind of all had to die, but it was for science, guys, science. So um, we had that. <laughs> so in these couple of pictures, you can see me doing some time to write and heart rate. Over to the left, you can see me with some crabs. And if you've never seen crabs getting their heart rate taken, that is exactly what it looks like. <laughs> Thank you to Carolyn for making these probes that were connected to the equipment because I probably would not have been able to do that. <laughs> so a huge shout out to her. These crabs were epoxy. There were back crabs epoxy going to these crabs to begin with. And once that epoxy had dried, they were kind of spun into these probes so we could take their heart rate. And you're probably wondering why only in that place. That's where their heart is found, right on the carapace of the back. Um, in the middle picture, you can see me taking, that was my first time recording the heart rates of a crab. And this was just a test run. So I was kind of scared that it was gonna pinch me without my glove on, but it was fun. And then over to the right, you can see me holding a crab. So time to write, when we were doing that, we had to place a crab down on its back and hold it down and make sure that it wasn't pinching and fighting us every second. And once it calmed down, we released, from, released the pressure from the crab and we timed how long it took to get back on all of its legs. And we timed that in seconds. So in these graphs, you can tell that there was not that much change and especially from the ANOVA that we ran. And the ANOVA is just what tells us if there was a lot of, if the treatment had a factor in time to write. And as you can tell, the numbers are pretty close to 0.5, which means that they didn't really have that much of a factor in it. And you can tell by the graphs that they're kind of in the same areas. But if you want to look at it closer, thanks for asking. <laughs> we have these. So the pre-sex side of each graph, that is when their time to write and time to write was taken 
after the acclimation for 32 parts per thousand. And then the post is the after they were acclimated to the new salinities that they were placed in. Now, there, I know you see a bunch of lines and these dots are connected. These dots are connected because these are the same crab IDs that they had and this is the change in their time to write throughout this process. Now, when we looked at heart rate, when we looked at the ANOVA, it did have a significant, um, fact. it was a significant factor in affecting heart rate. And we ran a two-key test. And in this two-key test, you could see that there wasn't that much change in the 32 compared to the 10. In the two-key test, you basically compare the different solutions and how they were um, acting towards each other. And in the 47 to 32, you can see that there was a different change. And if you look at the graph, if you look at the 32, that is much higher than the 47. Citrate synthase assay. Who's happy about biochemistry? <laughs> I know everybody might be a little traumatized by this graph, but I'm going to explain it and it's going to be great and we're going to smile and laugh. So the citrate synthase assay is a biochemical method used to measure the activity of the enzyme citrate synthase. So this measures metabolism. And um, this is where the posterior gill sample comes in hand and comes into play because through that posterior gill sample, since they use osmoregulation, they can trace that back to metabolism since it's working hard in some areas, but not working as hard in others. Now, I need to the graph. If you look up at the top, you see that acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate form citrate. Now, how do they do that? If you look a little bit closer, the red, the red words say citrate synthase, which is exactly what we're looking at. Now, that citrate synthase is the catalyst for this reaction to even happen. And this is the beginning of the TCA cycle. So without this reaction happening, no energy can be made for anything to happen. So basically, if no energy is made, then the crab is already dying. And we don't want that. We want happy crabs. These are a few pictures of me doing some citrate synthase. I've learned how to pipette, and I've really worked on my forearm muscles for this. <laughs> and over in the middle, you see a 96 well plate that we use for the citrate synthase. You can see that there are a different array of different yellow colors. This is because the DT and V that we used in this, um, that will act as the indicator for the acetyl-CoA actually absorbing the oxaloacetate once it was placed in there. And then over to the right is a picture of me with a computer that's almost as old as me. Um, and behind me, you can see a spectrophotometer. And these are, this is the technology that we use to analyze the citrate synthase. This computer was so fun to work with, a uh, flashback, Definitely, and we had to be very patient with it, but it was so fun to work with it. And I can say that I know something more than my sisters. <laughs> um, and I ran the citrate synthase assay, and these were the ANOVAs. The ANOVAs were actually not that much change in them, so it didn't really have an effect on the citrate synthase. But if you look closer at the graph, you can see that the 10 parts per thousand or yes, the 10 parts per thousand, that actually had a higher citrate synthase activity on here. And yeah. So the conclusions that we came to were green crops were not affected by the treatment in time to write, but they were affected by the heart rate through the different salinities. They were not affected through the citrate synthase as well. But why, what does this mean? What's the big picture? That's probably the question that you guys are asking right now. But what I learned is that the 47 is actually osmoregulating more efficiently. So the heart doesn't have to be higher than like the other ones. And the diluted water was not affected because that's what I assumed after looking at the Rivera Ingram paper. And I found that the diluted water was going to increase it, but unfortunately it did not, but we still got a good answer. And I did learn um, with these different environments that they're in, they can go to many different environments and either way they're going to thrive. They're going to be resilient and they're just great creatures all around besides messing up the environment if they're too many. <laughs> Uh, here are my work cited, and then some acknowledgements, acknowledgements that I would like to say is I would like to thank the PEP program. I am so thankful for being chosen to come out here to Woods Hole and just gain some experience. I want to thank Hui for also giving me more experience, giving me connections, and all of the 
events and lectures that they've had throughout the summer. I would also like to thank Sarah. She was the one that did all the crab surgeries. So I'm not a crab killer have students. <laughs> I've been accused. And I also would like to thank the crab crew over there to the right. We were in a 10 degree cooler for a very long time, but it's, it's okay. We all needed to cool off from the summer. <laughs> and that's it. So when I looked at the Rivera Ingram project, they also used 47 and 10, and I didn't want to put them in a range that they weren't going to be able to handle it, and then the crabs were immediately going to die. Destiny? How old were your crabs? So we don't know specifically how old they were because they were taken from a fish port, but we did um, measure their weights and sizes. And we did find that those were factors into the differences in the heart rate and citrate synthase. Mm, yeah, that's really what we could talk with them. Cam? Oh, were there any difficulties during your citrate synthase activity? Oh, most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> But it's science, so we got through it. Um, at first we were taking the um, pointy end of the gill, but we actually found that through that process that wasn't giving us what we actually wanted. So, and then we also had to work with different dilutions that were placed. So instead of using the end of the gill, we used the inner side of the gill because that was the one that gave us the most reaction that we were looking for. Because we were looking for a good incline with every single crab, and that's what we found. Yes. I'm curious about uh, the differences in like the range of the crab you studied versus the Mediterranean crab you talked about at the very beginning. So it seems like the crab you studied has really gone all over the globe. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that relates to your results. We didn't see as much of a change in the crab metabolism or heart rate as a function of the different studies. Do you know about what the range of the Mediterranean crab is, like versus the mm -hmm. range? Yeah, so the Mediterranean crab, they actually haven't spread as much. So with them finding that them in diluted, diluted salt water, that they are affected by it, we found that these crabs are just stronger and more resilient than those other crabs because they have been able to come everywhere here. Because so they were first introduced to the East Coast in the 1800s, but then they also came back in the 1980s. Yes. The things are light up if we mentioned biochemistry. <laughs> so you're working with an animal or a living being. Why why did you light up? What do you do back at the school and where are you at school? I am at the illustrious St. Augustine's University and I study chemistry. So everything that kind of has to do with this, I kind of like making it simpler for people to understand. That's why I kind of get excited to talk about it. So I didn't want to traumatize y'all with the picture, but I did have to get that point across and make it simpler for everyone. Thank you. Our next presenter is Ms. Gabriella Kurlowski. Hello, good morning, everyone. 
Excited to learn about some sharks. Yeah. Okay, my name is Gabriella Perlowski. I am a recent graduate from the University of Guam. And this summer I got to work with the Marine Biological Laboratory in the Gillis Lab under Dr. Michael Palmer and Dr. Andrew Gillis for my project. It's electric, understanding the development of electroreceptors in the chain cat shark or Spilorhinus redifer. Big buzzword, electroreception, what is it? It is a component of the lateral line present in all aquatic vertebrate animals. And it consists of the mechanosensory or neuromasts and the electrosensory or ancillary components. It is lost in most commonly studied aquatic models such as the zebrafish, this little guy, and the clawed frog, Xenopus. Aren't they cute? It is an important has an important role in detecting weak bioelectric fields. And this is a, this is a nice picture of the lateral line. Where, so now you know what electroreception is, where does it come from? The embryonic origins are not fully resolved. In skates, cell labeling shows origins in the neurogenic plaque codes, which are thickenings, this one right here, thickenings in the skin, it's labeled AD. And what they do is they extend above and below the eye, um, and they give rise to uh, they give rise to nervous system cell types. And in sharks, gene expression suggests keyword suggests um, suggests suggests origins in the neurocrest cells, which get, uh, come from the developing nervous system. And my research question is when and where do sharks start forming the electroreceptors? And we use the model, the chain cat shark or Silorhinus redifer. It is found in this area. Aren't they so cute? <laughs> For my methods, we first start by collecting egg cases from the Marine Resource Center. Um, snip them off the egg yolk, come out, snip them off the egg yolk. That was a nice, nice video of a dancing embryo. Um, and we used a couple of different stages of Silorhinus redifer. We used three total. This one here is our smallest one. And then those are like actual legit baby sharks. Um, and what we did was we fixed them in paraffin aldehyde and embedded them in paraffin wax to start our sectioning and staining. And this picture here is me on this cool machine called a microtome. And what that does is it takes your wax blocks, cuts them up into super thin uh, strips, which is the part in the middle here that has the tissues. And you set them up for the staining process. And we use two different types of staining processes, hematoxylin and eosin, which gives a nice visual, visual adjacent. And that will be henceforth known as HME because that's a lot of words. <laughs> um, and a process of antibody stainings, which I'll get into further. For my results, we have our embryonic stage 22, which is a, an embryo that shows the formation of the anterior dorsal lateral black coat. Here we have a nice picture with the developing heart, the developing eye. This is really hard to do. And this red dotted line is the section of interest. That's where we cut through in the microtome and we slice them. That sounds so bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, this right here, these are the H and E stains, and it, they show really nice visuals of what the tissue looks like. This tissue shows um, this, mag this high, mag high, high magnified picture shows what the actual placodes look like. This is when the placodes have started to form, when they start to thicken. Um, and this one shows it right above the eye. Really important to note, they go above and below the eye. And this one right here is our antibody staining. We use the epithelial cadherin or e cadherin staining. And that just shows how those cells start to thicken really nicely. For our second stage, embryonic stage 27, this is when the primordium starts to elongate and sink below the skin. Our h &E is right below the eye. Now you know what it looks like above and below. This shows where it starts. 
and how it looks. The high mag right here. And we use the SOX2 staining, which is able to fluorescently label how the primordium looks. And as you see here in, oh, in this nice dotted line, we have SOX2 fluorescently in green, which shows the sinking and it also shows where it originated from. Isn't that cool? And for embryonic stage 31, that is an actual shark. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, the cells have differentiated into the sensory and the support cells. We have a nice picture of the mechanosensory and a nice picture of the electrosensory. Buzzword again, electrosensory. In the red circle, it shows, I know it's kind of hard to see and I'm gonna apologize, but right here, that is where the hair cells are. That is the nucleotide of the hair cell. And finally, we have our antibody staining. And for the formation of the mechanosensory, we use a different antibody, which stains for the hair cells called SV2. That pretty much labels synapsis. Um, and in the electro, in the mechanosensory, it fluoresces pretty well. Um, SOX2 and SV2 show very nicely. And in the electrosensory, SOX2 and SV2 kind of don't look as nice as the other one. Um, for the electroreception, it is broadly labeling hair and support cells, while in mechanosensory, you can see that the neuromass is just differentiated and the hair cells are present. Um, there could be several reasons as to why the hair cells are strongly labeled. We could need to use a different antibody. They're just lagging behind, or they could just be like super, super slow and we just caught it at a bad time. For my further plans and research, once again, to reiterate, cell labeling in skates show that neurogenic plaque codes come, they're or they originate from neurogenic plaque codes, and gene expression only suggests origin in the neural crest cells. This project pretty much set the stage for cell labeling that can directly test where the embryonic origin, that, the, that there is embryonic origin in plaque codes. Um, there's also a potential to use the neural crest to see if there's actual significant contribution as it's been suggested. Um, or we can just use a bunch of different antibodies um, to see it as markers. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the Gillis Lab, Michael, Andrew, Krista, and Rocky, my fellow summer interns, the PEP program, Angie, and most especially Monet for always being there, especially when we're all stressed and crying. Um, and of course, the house who put up with me coming home <laughs> and talking about my sharks for 40 minutes um, and the rest of the 2023 PEP cohort. Thank you very much. Any questions? Sharks and skates, um, they're in the same family, they're, you know, Latin ranks, um, and then they both have photoreceptors. So is them having different like uh so like ways of like embryonically developing them? Does that mean that they converge to one have, have an electroreceptors or like what does that mean? Oh my gosh, I don't actually know. <laughs> Can I get back to you on that count? Like for real? Yeah, great. <laughs> Okay. Do you have any difficulties with making the um, with the process of making the slides, and how would you go forward in correcting those steps? There was one issue. Um, we put these guys in this thing called histosol, and I had put them in through their three washes, and they just did not work. They wouldn't clear. They wouldn't set. So I had to borrow one of Andrew's sections. Um, I think, I don't know how I would, maybe I'd clear them some more, maybe I would put them through more of this to sell, but that also risks over clearing and over processing. 
So I think that's something, if I had more time during the summer, I would have liked to go through, and I would have liked to correct. Miles. This is a great project. I was curious, would you want to continue this after uh, when you do grad school? Absolutely. Yeah. And would you want to do it on like different charts, maybe? You know, bigger sharks or smaller sharks or whatever. Well, I mean, absolutely, one hundred percent. I would continue this, and I would come back if Pep would allow me. Um, and I really liked working with the chain cat shark. One, they're super cute, and super cool. It's really amazing to see their egg cases up front and personal and close. Um, so I wouldn't change the species that I work on. Lauren. Yes. Does this have like a label thing for you? Like, what does this mean? Like, what are you going to go back to form and do? Like, um, well, being from an island, we have mostly shark species around us in our reefs. It's all pretty much sharks. And I, in turn, want to be a shark biologist. So, this is like the perfect project for me. Um, I already have plans on attending graduate school for shark biology. So all of this knowledge that I brought back, especially on how we can start a different process, like a different project is really interesting. And it's something that I can work on as a graduate student or come back to. But yeah, it's really ecologically important to know when these electroreceptors begin because that's how they detect prey in the water. Our next speaker is Ms. Destiny Coleman. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I'm Destiny Coleman. I am hailing from the highest of seven hills, the number one public HBCU for the fourth year and counting. What? Florida Agricultural and Kennedy University. <laughs> and this, <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. And this summer, I've been working at NOAA at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. I've been working under Dave McElroy in the Columbia Research Branch. And this, um, mm, this summer, my research has been following the factors influencing Acadian redfish presence in the Gulf of Maine bottom line survey. This is this the, okay, perfect. So the Gulf of Maine bottom line survey was implemented in 2014 by the Northeast Fishery Science Center. Um, it goes out twice a year, every spring and fall. This survey was started to better observe the habitat of the Gulf of Maine. Oftentimes it's very rocky, rough, structured, so it's hard to sample species like cod and redfish, which are very biologically and economically important, but it's just hard to sample them by traditional methods like trawling. So we started this survey, which consists of the long line. Where is my pointer? Okay, wait. Okay, it's the rope down there with the hooks. But it consists of a baited bottom long line, which fish are captured and then biologically sampled. That data can be further used for stock assessments or for age of reproductive purposes. There's also current temperature and depth measurements that go on at the stations to get some ideas of the ocean conditions. And the focus of my project is the video, oh, there we go, the video system there, which is deployed at each station to actually capture video of the bottom habitat. And so 
I mentioned that the survey goes out two times a year. There are two different vessels, the Mary Elizabeth and the Tenacious Two. They each go to about 20 different stations each, every survey, every season. And the video just helps to identify some inaccuracies, which can come from just looking at numerical data. So you may be asking, why redfish? Well, thank you for asking. So I noticed that when I watched the habitat videos, which was what the focus of my project was this year, I noticed that I see these little redfish all the time. And I had the creative freedom, I guess, to decide what I wanted my project to be on based on watching the videos. And since I saw these fish a lot, I wanted to do something that I had a lot of data to choose. And once talking to my mentor, we came up with some good ideas. And we noticed that there's a difference in numbers of, I saw them on the videos quite a bit. There's a difference in the numbers for the catch data, the long line catch data. So I want to see what's causing that disconnect in numbers. So first, let's talk about redfish. The genus Sebastis is inclusive of at least three different species. Bastiatus, which is on the far left there, the focus of my study. Mentella, or the deep water redfish. And Marinus, or the golden redfish. Um, these other two species here aren't really seen too much in US waters. So Sebastian speciatus, the Acadian redfish, is mostly what we see here in this region. They are the shallower and younger of the redfish. They're found mostly from 150 to 300 meters. They can live up to 50 years old, and their range is from New Jersey to Iceland. The Sebastian species in total, they're all thin, thick, slow growing, long living fish with a very low natural mortality. Um, they don't show much evidence of latitudinal migration. They're thought to be pretty sedentary. They get into their habitats and stay there, but they do exhibit what's called diurnal vertical migration, where they come off the seafloor at some point during the night, feed in the upper levels of the water column, and then return to the seabed by dusk. So redfish are rockfish. They are pretty strongly closely associated with rocky structures in their habitat. You'll often see them with boulder leaves, like in this picture here. Um, they're found with sponges like these, or attached anemones, or burrowing anemones, which I'll probably use the word seriantin, so don't get confused. Um, they use these structured habitats to either serve as a refuge from predators, which are usually going to be any fish that's bigger than them, or they're going to actually use these habitats to have protection from ocean conditions. So they're not strong swimmers, they don't move a lot, they kind of either remain static, like this fish is doing here, it's just next to the Sarianthid, or they'll do what's called drifting, where they're just floating in the water column for the most part, they might swim just enough to not become displaced. So they oftentimes use their habitats, they'll find them in the crevices, so they actually just don't get blown away by the current. Now some less fun stuff. Unfortunately, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than up to 99% of global ocean surface temperatures. This is a figure showing the major currents affecting the Gulf of Maine. Um, this big red arrow here and the curly blue arrow back there. The red one is the Gulf Stream, which brings warm waters in from the south. And that curly blue arrow up there brings colder waters in from the north. So what's happening over these past decades, the Gulf Stream is bringing in a lot warmer waters, much stronger than the Labrador Current is bringing in cool water. And since this area has very variable topography, we can kind of see a little bit of the thin tree over there. Um, it's very uh, strongly influenced by mixing, and there's already some changes being seen. There's a projected increase of three to five degrees Celsius in just bottom water temperatures alone. And this is affecting the phenology of marine life, phenology meaning the timing of reoccurring life events like spawning or migration. And it's also affecting fisheries and recreation, commercial industries, and you can see a stratification in increase, which means there'll be more distinct levels 
of the ocean layers rather than that good mixing that we want to see. So in order to determine what factors are influencing the presence of redfish on both the long line survey and in the videos, I looked at the long line catch data and video data from fall of 2020 through spring of 2022. I looked at number one, just what's the difference between their presence in the long line and their presence on the videos. Then I looked at the influence of terrain readiness index. I will explain that concept further, don't worry. And I looked at the influence of temperature and bottom depth, as well as the correlation between redfish presence and anemone presence in type. So this first map here is showing where redfish were found on the long line for the years that I stated. So it looks like there's a lot going on, but the triangles are representative of rough substrate, the circles are representative of smooth substrate, and pink is indicative of spring, red is indicative of fall. And the X's just mean they weren't found there. So you can see there's a pretty, you know, pretty regular range. There's only a few circles indicating smooth um, substrate. But when you look at the next map, which is showing the same thing, but for video data, you see a lot more X's. So out of the 180 stations, redfish were seen at 26 stations on video and 56 stations on long line. And to determine whether there was a significant difference between the ratio of presence and absence between these sampling methods, we used the Mac and Mars test and found that there was a, a significant difference between these sampling methods. And it was found that redfish are seen less frequently in the video, but more frequently in the video if they were also seen on the survey. So I mentioned TRI earlier, and if you didn't know what a T and R or an I was, like I didn't, no fear, that's why I'm here. So TRI is basically a measurement of how flat or rough a substrate or a topography is. So it's measured by points of elevation, calculated into cells, and then calculated by the changes between those cells. So a higher number of change between them means that there's a higher TRI, meaning that it's a rougher area, a more elevated or jagged area. So I found using some more of our probabilities tests like the Mac and Mars test, that the influence of TRI is actually the most significant factor affecting redfish presence on the survey long line. So our graph here might look a little wonky. Um, we only looked at presence and absence, so it's only zero and one on my y-axis and mean TRI from stations is on the x-axis, of course. So we use generalized linear models. Um, that would be the orange line you see there, which is basically our prediction line based on the trends from this data, because you can see the best fit line is a bit, you know, weird looking, but basically redfish are more likely to be present if there's a higher TRI based on this data here. I also conducted the same test to see what factors were most significant for redfish presence in video, and it turned out to be depth and temperature at the stations that were the most influential. We once again have our best fit line, which is green, and our generalized linear model or prediction, which is purple. And this top graph is mean depth, the bottom is mean temperature. So you can see that as depths get deeper, redfish are less present. And as temperatures rise, redfish are also less present. And lastly, I use the video data to see whether there was a correlation between anemone presence and type and redfish presence. So we use the chi-square independence test, which is another probability hypothesis test to see that if these two factors occur by chance or if there's actually a correlation there. And although these numbers on our graphs look very similar between burrowing and attached anemones, it was only found that attached anemones have a significant effect on redfish presence, a positive effect on redfish presence, which I found kind of interesting because in most of my background research that I was conducting, I saw that I mostly see redfish are associated with serianthids or those burrowing anemones, but both of them provide structure, so I guess it makes sense. Now getting into some discussion. 
So first things first, the limitations of this study or some things to consider. Correlation does not equal causation here. These are all predictors of redfish presence. Um, if you have a higher TRI, you might see more redfish or you're more likely to see more redfish, but it's not exactly a set of stone cause. This is also just a test of presence versus absence, a yes or no. It's not a numerical quantity of redfish we're seeing at these stations or not at other stations. And as for the video quality, all the videos are not the same. Some of them are really short. Sometimes the camera gets tipped over. You can't see anything anymore. Sometimes it's blurry. Um, and then some other parameters like time of day, sponge presence, currents at the station were either not available or they weren't significant indicators. So we're able to be used in the study. Now, some discussion for the long line. I mentioned TRI is the only influential factor that we found. A higher TRI means you're more likely to see redfish and they're found up to a TRI of about 25. And TRI is important to remember, it's not indicative of substrate type. So it's not telling us there's boulders there or there's structured mud there. It's just giving us those points of elevation. And this is another picture of the long line here. It's a squid baited long line that's used in the survey. So just wanted you guys to see a visual of that if you're not familiar with fisheries, like I was not. Oh, um, and then as for my video data, we found that bottom depth and temperature were the most influential factors. Redfish were found in less than 200 meters. This makes sense because we know that redfish are found between 150 to 300 meters. And they mostly were seen in seven to nine degrees Celsius. Once again, this makes sense because redfish prefer six to nine degrees Celsius. And temperature decreases with depth. We know this, and there was also a positive correlation between redfish presence and the presence of attached anemones. And this is another person in the cooperative research branch, Emma, who is pulling the camera page out of the water. That's what records all the video data. So these are my references. I'm gonna let you guys clap now. Now some thank yous. I want to thank Giovanni and Lindsay. Giovanni made sure I actually had videos to watch this summer and he's very helpful. Lindsay made sure that I had my graphs and my maps done. I would not have been able to do it without her. I want to thank my mentor again and all three of them because they answered all of my fish identification questions, which may have been dumb to them, but I'm not a fisheries person, so this is very helpful. Um, I want to thank the rest of the cooperative research branch I know of, both the Narragansett branch and the Woods Hole branch. Y'all have been so supportive and happy to meet me and talk to me. Um, our pep coordinator, Monet, you guys are going to hear everybody talk her up, and she definitely deserves it. She's amazing. She's everything, plus our coordinator. Uh, I want to thank all of the directors and mentors, George and Dr. Gerald and Angie. And I guess I'll thank my pets. <laughs> you guys are cool or whatever. <laughs> All right, do I have any questions? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, when you were deciding if they were associated with anemone, how did you, what was your criteria? Like, how close did they have to be to an anemone? So we use the video data for that because anemones are not targeted on the long line survey. And I usually see redfish, like if I go back to this picture here, I'll usually see them like in this picture to the right, like I can see them right next to the anemones or both of these pictures actually. I can actually see them with the anemones, not necessarily like, they have to be in the same view frame of the camera, not like, oh, I saw an anemone over here, and then the camera bounced and I saw a redfish, more so just like that. Um, any other questions? I know you guys have watched a lot of videos. I was just wondering who your favorite thing to see. I saw an octopus. It was so cool. Like it was kind of in the sand, and I was looking at it, and it was like I kind of saw an eye. I'm like, I know that's not what I think it is. And then I actually got it and like floated across the screen. That was just so cool to me. I saw like some founders too, and I just think they're funny. And, <laughs> And I saw like a dogfish in my last video, so that was cool. Yes. If you had more time to like continue this project, what's a direction that you want to take? 
I'm actually not sure. So this project, like I said, was initiated in 2014, so almost 10 years now. There's a lot of videos and not a lot of people to watch them. So I would be happy to just watch some videos and then kind of just let the spirit guide me to learn more about to be researching. <laughs> okay, um, I know I'm at like 17 minutes, so I'll call it there. Thank you all. Our next guest speaker is Mr. Aaron Edley. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is, my name is Aaron Edley. Um, I, my name is Aaron Edley. Um, I, am, I go to school at Virginia State University which is located in historic, historic Petersburg. I am a junior and I'm majoring in mechanical engineering. And my project is on salt marsh restoration using soil shear strength. So before we go into the presentation, let's go over the topics that I'm going to discuss. So we're gonna go, so the topics I'm gonna to discuss are Study rationale, um, salt marsh importance, characteristics of salt of the salt marshes, shear strength factors, the questions I asked, the methods I used, my results, and my conclusions. So, why are salt marshes important? Well, they absorb the impacts of coastal storms by dissipating dis wave energy and storm surges. They protect the coastlines from erosion and they, they're, a they're a carbon sink, which means they absorb large quantities of carbon from the atmosphere. They are nursery, nursery habitat for juvenile species like crabs, fish, and uh, like small sharks and rays, and et cetera. And they are nutrient buffers. So what is soil shear strength? As you may ask, um, it's the maximum stress that the soil may sustain without experiencing failure. It, it, it also influences stability and resilience of the marsh, of the marsh ecosystem against various external forces like tides, storms, and human activity. Measuring um, shear strength is important to protect against erosion. So the device that you see on your right here is called a so it's called a soil shear vane. I used it to actually calculate the um, soil shear strength of my um, of the data that I'm going to show you in the method slides. So, what are the factors of shear strength? Um, the soil types in the marsh are is basically just peat. So the whole piece just dead plant matter, and there's like a little bit of sand as well. Bulk density is that also affects it. It's a indicator of soil compaction. Bulk density is, is just basically indicator of soil compaction, which helps. It actually influences shear strength as well. Organic matter. This includes trees, shrubs, grasses, and roots. Also decaying plant matter moisture content and bulk and human activity. So organic matter actually affects soil shear strength and root systems also affect bulk density, which is an indicator of shear strength. So the questions I, the questions I asked, 
Well, how does shear strength differ between areas of healthy marsh and areas of shallow standing water? And my next question they asked is, how, how shear strength is impacted by organic matter and bulk density? Well, this is a map of Dockhead Mark. Of, this is a map of the, um, South Cape Beach, which is located in Mass Massachusetts. It's adjacent to Okoy Bay. Um, I don't know if you can see on the map right there, it's adjacent to it. it's like a little, little, little um, red, sort of red square. Um, and the blue and red patches um, that you see, um, that you can see right there, the little the, um, red one and the blue one right there, those, that's the blue one is control, the control site, and the um, rest of treatment. So these patches, they, they're pools and ponds, sensibly. And as you see here in the control, the control's blue, treatment's red, and reference is in green. The reference is a healthy marsh. So it's just grass, it's a whole bunch of little grasses, grasses, the, it's, um, it's moist, it's, it's relatively healthy. And then for the blue lines, I don't know if you can see it, I don't know if you can see it that well. Um, yeah, those blue lines right there next to um, the red um, circle right there. Those are runnels that we're gonna um, place. So runnels are areas where we're gonna, we're gonna place these runnels in the near those near those pools to drain them, drain the drain the ponds to drain those. It's a pre-treatment year and it's a pre-treatment year. And once again, I'm gonna say it one more time so everyone can understand it. Green, those green dots on the screen are healthy marsh. As a reference, reference means healthy. Just to get that away so no one's confused and be like, what the hell is what, what the hell is he talking about? So yeah, so for this one, this is my method slide. Um, I know this is in my this is in the marsh, but the rest of them were rest of them were bigger of, of the marsh that I worked at. Um, so we have 15 sites, five reference, which is healthy, five treatment, and five control. We measure shear strength at three depths, 10, 15, and 30 centimeters. We measure organic matter, bulk density, and moisture content in the first five centimeters of the soil. Moving into the results. So this is the results for shear strength. As you can see on the screen, um, the, um, the treatments um, are on the x-axis. Shear strength is on the y-axis. Shear strength is measured in kilopascals, which I don't know if you know this, but it's like a um, kilopascals. You you see a lot if you're if you're doing physics, engineering, and other sciences and stuff. But as a as mechanical engineer, I see it all the time and it's kind of gotten to my head. Um, so it shows that you see, you see um, treatment, is treatment is control. You see control, treatment, and reference. The depths are, are is the measurement of centimeters, which is on the, um, right there, 10, 15, and 30. So control is strongest at 30 centimeters. Um, Treatment is strongest at 10, and reference is strongest at 15. So, so, I'll, so I'll say it one more time, sure, sure strength on the Y, measuring kilopascals, and treatment is on the X. All right, so these are the results for the average of organic matter. So I found out that it's, just, it's really actually really cool, but um, organic matter is actually higher in the reference, which is expected because it's a healthy, it's a really healthy marsh. There's nothing, it's not bad. It's really cool, it's really interesting. It's, you're not sinking into a hole or anything like, a, like you were to get control. 
which I found out the hard way, which was not fun at all. First day and then last day. Last day, Mark said, here, Aaron, time for your last day. Get, get you all wet. <laughs> so this graph shows organic matter at different sites. It shows controls in um, blue, um, treatments in red, and references in green. So for the previous graph they just saw, it's the same colors but um, I just changed the graph a little bit because I had to make sure the graph was perfect. And um, I, I, I just didn't like the colors of the previous one. So I, I, I still kept the previous one, but I, um, I just changed the colors to match it up. So the treatments on the X, X values are control, treatment, and reference. Organic matter is actually measured in percentages, this percent basically, um, and it's on the Y, as you see right there. I hope you can see, just to say. All right. So this is the um, average for bulk density, which um, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll say something about bulk density. It's actually really interesting. And bulk density is basically just like the definition of density, which, which everyone in science should know, which is D equals mass over volume. It's just basically the same thing, even though I, so, you know, I was like, what the heck is it? I was trying, I was trying to research it and I couldn't find it. So couldn't find that picture, but it's ended up being the same thing. So, and so this one shows in the control and treatment sites, bulk density is actually, bulk density, control and treatment sites, bulk density is actually higher than record sites, which is kind of surprising, but um, not really. So it shows that bulk density is measured in grams per centimeter cubed at different depths of the soil at three treatment sites. The treatment is on X. The X values are still the same. Control, treatment, and reference. Reference is healthy. All right, and bulk, bulk density. All right, so we get, all right, so interesting. Let's go to the next one. Shall we? So this graph shows the relationship between bulk density and shear strength. So it shows that as um, bulk density increases, shear strength increases as well in the reference and control. So let me show you all real quick. So the um, references is in the green and then, and then the control is in the blue and the treatment is in the red. So, for this for the um, treatment, the reason why the treatment has the treatment site has no relationship between bulk density and shear strength, that's because it's literally zero. It's like it's flat, just like if you're doing math, basically in pre-calc algebra, whatever. That's just flat. So there's no relationship in the head in the treatment. So the treatment's just like kind of dead, and then the control and reference are just having a good time, and the treatment's just left behind. Kind of struggling, wanting a baby or something, or something. So for organic organic matter, organic matter is still is still percent. Okay, it's organic matter to shear strength. So as for, as organic matter increases, shear strength decreases in the control and treatment sites. The reference has the reference has no relationship between or, organic matter and shear strength. As you can see again, the reference is relatively flat, so that's zero. Um, shear strength is decreasing, organic matter is still going this way, it's still going to the right. Lost the conclusions. All right, so what I found is that's really cool. Um, the formation of pools increases bulk density, which increases shear strength. Um, ponds and pools and ponds decrease organic matter, which decreases shear strength. Um, I found out that it was really cool um, that so much restoration of the is actually really important to encourage, re to encourage revegetation. Um, it's important to encourage revegetation, will increase low ground organic matter and hopefully increase sediment shear strength. Without that, the, um, it actually allows the grass to go back and then. We need them. We need them. We need marshes. We need marshes because they protect us against all these storms and everything. And um, and so it's a wonderful place to be.
So I'd like to acknowledge um, the wonderful Hillary Sullivan right back there. She actually helped me out through this whole entire process, guiding me through everything and um, being patient with me. Even though at times I'm like, I feel like I'm just like struggling. It's not really, it's just really hard. Um, I've had a really wonderful time with Hillary. Um, thanks for all, thanks for all you on time and everything. I'd like to thank the um, Woods Hole Partnership Program, also known as PEP, with all the PEP PEPsters right here, everyone in the front, the front. And I'd like to thank um, Phil Timmis, my um, boy mentor. She helped me with a lot of the graphs that you see here today. And without her, I'll be always just struggling without struggling doing all her. I'd like to thank Dr. Ambrose Gerald in the back right there, the distinguished gentleman, for all his wisdom and all his wisdom and actually helping me to see see the products through a different lens versus my versus my own. I like to thank Molly Murphy right here on the same side, lovely Molly Murphy. She helped us all out in the PEP program. Without her, on a, without her guidance and everything, without her um, advice and everything, I don't know what we would have done. Um, I like to thank Rosie Hilton for. Um, for, for um, helping me um, get, get, get out of the data for, for organic matter and for my organic matter bulk density data. Without that, you wouldn't be able to see it. And I'd like to thank Abigail Morris for actually um, helping me out um, gathering the um, shear strength data that I collected in the marsh. And I'd like to thank Woodwell Climate Research Center. But everybody in here, that everybody who was from Woodwell, I'd like to thank them all because it was a great opportunity to meet everybody and to um, understand what you do and, and help me out and yeah, um, hopefully help me out in the future and um, another another launch of goals, which I hope to pursue. Thank you, any questions? Sorry I took so long, I was trying to make sure perfect. All right, all right. Any questions? Yes. Um, earlier you said that shear strength is like a indication of, or it, it's a measure of something like the soil fails. What does failure look like? It's soil. like when the basically it's like the soil kind of like breaks apart, kind of like it just okay. sinks. Okay. So it's not really um, like it, the soil is breaking apart and stuff. So it's um, it's a kind of, it's a tricky term to, to um, do, especially from from an engineering standpoint. It's actually not that easy to to identify. So it's just um, it's basically when soil kind of breaks breaks the park kind of crumbles, just falls apart. Our next presenter will be Ms. Isis Keys. Um, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> All right, great. Well, hello everybody. My name is Isis Keys. I got a Cal Poly, I'm a rising sophomore at Cal Poly Humboldt and at Pui, which is the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. My project will be on hydrothermal event communities in late stage succession along the East Pacific Rise. So, as an introduction, what exactly are hydrothermal events? Hydrothermal events are Volcanic, volcanic like structures 
that excrete chemical chemical like fluid, um, and these structures are created through the percolation of seawater um, near tectonic spreading centers, specifically. So in the background, you have a hydrothermal vent, specifically a black smoker. And these things emit chemicals such as mostly um, sulfates. And then over here on, I believe you're right, you have an eruption, which is pretty cool. And then right below it, we have what would happen after an eruption. So here you probably just see molten lava, but underneath that molten lava is in a community that got swallowed by it. So what does what does succession in hydrothermal event? I guess how does the succession in hydrothermal event communities affect them? So giving a little bit more detail about the molten lava going over the communities. Um, these communities specifically go through succession periods, which are periods of time where they're completely eradicated, as in there are no more organisms in that space. And then they have to recover um, through larvae coming in um, through jets, which are currents that are along hydrothermal vents, and they will settle um, and recolonize that space. Um, these communities are unique because they're, when they come back, um, their main primary production is, is chemosynthetic. So a lot of the smaller organisms that come back, and they're usually one single cell organisms, they come back and they use chemosynthesis. And that's, and then we start having more predators and so forth. Um, over here is a bunch of larvae and we have a crab. Where's my phone? Yeah, so we have a crab, we have a small polychaete, we have clams, and then we also have a larvae of the pedodrillus. And so due to these su succession periods, our lab, um, specifically at Dr. Um, Lauren Molyneux's lab, we look at succession as a theory, a time series theory. And so on this graph on the x-axis, okay, on the x-axis, you have the number of species, and then in the years is our time series. Every 10 years, there's supposed to be an eruption, as in complete eradication of that space. So. After that, the new um, new communities come in, or new or larvae come in to settle in the space will come, and then there will be a recovery period. Now, because of um, succession, these organisms actually succeed each other. So it's still it's still a battle in terms of like what species will take will be the most dominant. And so what we're looking, specifically looking at is another theory, which is illustrated by the thicker green curve, which is uh, what would happen in terms of, of number of species if there was no disturbance at all. And so this is important in our hypothesis of species composition at hydrothermal vents along the East Pacific rise con that continued to change 15 years after 2006. Eruption. So when we say composition, we're specifically looking at the number of species in that group. And then that will tell us about um, the group's functionality as in each species role in that ecosystem. So which then brings us to our methods. So once again, we're specifically looking at the East Pacific rise and our study areas is nine, nine degrees north on the East Pacific rise. So here I have a map of our study area, which is about off, actually pretty damn close to the coast of Mexico here. And then we have my site that I'm specifically looking at, which is Tika, and the area around Tika. So looking at this is important because Tika is a site who, which is eruption. It's still an active event, but its eruption is actually overdue. And so, Looking at this, we also have looked at P event, which is still a vent near Tika, but it's now an inactive vent. So we specifically get these specimens off of these vents through cruises, and these cruises jobs are to both deploy and retrieve uh, sandwiches. So this is the sandwiches. It is a six layered plate 
um, colonization sandwich. And so its main role is to take any uh, larvae that is coming through through these jets and are settling um, near or on the vents and they will come and actually settle on the sandwich. And so what we do then is we then deploy a, um, a submersible and that is specifically meant is it well his job is to actually like go down and deploy the sandwich and then bring it back up so um the most recent sandwich that i'm looking at is at 2020 is from 2021 um and it was retrieved by the uh roger Ravel, which is illustrated here just is illustrated here um and so one of my contributions is looking at the sandwiches. So what we do is you saw the six layer um, plates. So we take the plate, I take the plate, I put it under a microscope, which is illustrated here. And then I, I look at species and sometimes I can pick them off of the plate and put them in a vial. And then if I can't really identify the species, I put them in a Petri dish for Susan Mills was also my mentor in counting, um, when IDing and counting of these species. Um, she'll help me out with identifying them. So that's what I'm doing. And then what's also cool is that I got to pick this um, off of a plate. This is Ophria troca axani. And you can, it is a polychaete and it's specifically known for its jaws. It kind of looks like it's on its neck, but it's kind of like, it's used to kind of like come out and then like go hunt and like feed. And what's also cool about them is that they can actually, um, they can actually like eat uh, metals and like rocks. So, and these uh, organisms range from 60 microns to 300 microns, depending on if they're adults or if they're a larvae. So getting into our results, I've, I did a second contribution. Um, for this lab and my second contribution is actually analyzing the 2021 data set and the data set is has all the abundances and of like each species that we found at the vents so what i got to do is i took this data set and put it in our plot and our plot is basically just a program that takes your data and graphs it and you can do whatever you want with it. You can make a bar graph, you can make a line graph. Essentially, it just takes your data and puts it in graph form so that in our studies, we get to see the trends of these species over time after the eruption. So here on the x-axis, we have the months after the 2006 eruption, which mind you, the 2000, after the 2006 eruption, there has not been an eruption since. So, we get to look at the abundance in logarithmic form um, between each species. And then we have our zones. So remember I was talking about the sandwiches and then deploying it? Well, we don't just deploy sandwiches. And in fact, we deploy three, at least three sandwiches and we take them back up and we retrieve them. And these three sandwiches are near hot zone, the warm zone, or the cool zone, which is illustrated by red, hot, yellow, warm, and blue, cool. And this essentially tells us how close they are to the vent, which also tells us that, I guess, what organisms are more prevalent near these zones, which tells me their functionality, which is, once again, um, each species role or each species function in an ecosystem. So with this, I wanna go through this telling a story, specifically of who they are, and also how they've come to be. And I want to start with our early pioneers. So for our early pioneers, I have Tinocota periphera and Lepidodrillus tiffnianus. And these are hard shelled organisms that um, specifically eat the small microbes that are chemosynthetic on the vent floor. So I character I characterize them as early pioneers because you can see right here that you see them more prevalent and more abundant between nine months and 22 months for Tinocolta periphera. And you start to see them disappear after that. 
and then also end up to just to, to be honest, they there for a lot longer, but then they just, I mean, they kind of cut on 96 months, but they just kind of give up after that. <laughs> but then we have our midterm settlers, which are, which are uh, species that have settled and colonized that same space, but later on. So for our midterm, I characterize them because they're not prevalent in the beginning, but they start getting rapidly abundant towards the middle. So I characterize them two different ways. As you can see here for Bathymodiolus uh, thermophilus, which is a mussel, you see them really spike at 22, 33 months. But then you start to also see them decline and re-increase at 182 months. As circulants, which are filter feeders, and they're basically feather duster worms on um, near the vent. Yeah. So you see them in the middle, and then you also see them kind of go down at 182 months, but they're not as at 182 months. Yeah, so they do start to decrease here. But there are species like uh, Eulipotopsis vitrea and Lepidodrillus Lepid ovalis. They really do start to increase rapidly at 182 months. And they also come in more prevalently um, towards the middle. And then we have our later species. So these species come in, that's Arganoma rosacea, um, more towards your left. And these species come in and really start to in increase in abundance um, at 182 months. The, and then you also see that similar pattern, even though they're not as defined as uh, Arganoma rosacea, Beth and Margarita and Plector still has that same pattern. They're still increasing over time, especially at 182 months. And then we have two new species we found on the bed. So I do not have a photo of hydroids for you because they're not even supposed to be on the vent in the first place. But for hydroids, we saw them near the hot zone, as in very close to the vent um, at 182 months. And then we also saw the clam uh, Calyptogena magnifica. I do not know where they are on the zone, but they are also new um, to this area. And we're also not really supposed to be there. So then we have our resurging species. And this is, so this is not, so we have a sickle gannids, which are giant tube worms. And that is not the bar graph for giant tube worms. But what happened here is that there was supposed to be more abundance between nine months and 33 months. And they're more prevalent towards the hot zone, but you do see them in the warm and cool zone. But then you start seeing them disappear between 96 and 135 months. But then they resurge back again at 182, exactly on the hot zone. So, what does this basically tell me? And what do I really want you to walk away with? I want you to walk away knowing that not only do we find new taxa, but composition and functionality in these ecosystems are indeed changing. And they're changing after 15 years after the 2006 eruption, which is actually important because it does tell us that secession is important in terms of the abundance and structure of vent communities. With this, um, we also found that recovery at these events after an eruption is, it takes longer than expected. So in previous studies, just to give you a little bit more background, um, previous studies said that these events recover within two years. And that's incorrect because they actually recover between four and 10 years. But because of the assumption that they do recover in two years, we have a problem with deep sea mining. So I know y'all have your phones, I know y'all have your laptops, this comes from specifically old mining and it's mining at um, near these vents that they're able to get materials to create these things. But it's also important that in our ongoing study that we prove this incorrect because it's important to like preserve and to protect these sites. These are still organisms that deserve to be explored, deserve to be recognized, even though they're not prevalent to our knowledge, at least 
at a broad scale. So with that, I also want to give my acknowledgments to everybody in the Pop Pet Program, um, definitely to Dylan Tippis and my Gojo Food Menaces for just helping me with R. And then I want to also appreciate Susan and Lauren Bongenu who have been helping me the, like the entire time, making plans, um, learning how to pronounce all the names and just, I guess, just being there, you know? So, and then also wanna, um, I also want to acknowledge the funding, funding that goes in this from the National Science Foundation, because they've also been keeping this research going. So yeah, thank you. I'll take any questions. Okay, Kim. All right, so how exactly do those sandwiches that you um, how exactly do they either capture or like coax animals into going into them? How do they get in there? So when these species are larvae, they're planktonic. So they don't just choose where they get to go. They either go up or they go down. So when they go to events and they they come they go down and then they settle on basically anything, either near event or away from it. So these sandwiches are deployed to specifically catch them while they're going down and settling on any surface. So that's how um, that's how the sandwiches work. And then we recover them through. Um, I believe they're, okay, they are called some submersibles. They are submersibles. And so they get pulled, so we're on the cruise, they're on the cruise, right? They're on the cruise and they're on a ship. And so the ship actually deploys the submersible down to the sea floor in which the submersible will um, extend the sandwich, put it on the floor, and then, or they pick it up and they bring it back up. So that's how that works, if that answers your question. And our last presentation before our break, Mr. Sam Barrett. Thank all of you so much. I got to say, I'm excited to be able to talk about barnacles for 12 minutes. Uh, I definitely can't get away with this with my family or friends. Um, so my project this summer is about barnacle settlement periods on Cape Cod. Now, um, why do we care about this? Um, because this, um, because oyster farms have a big problem with um, biofouling, which is the covering of um, their equipment with um, like specifically barnacles. Um, and if there's too many barnacles on a certain, um, on certain equipment, it can cause like increased labor costs or increased uh, problems. Um, if there's too much barnacles on a cage, it can like cut out water flow and cause like uh, even oyster death in the worst case. Also, it's good to identify um, settler species. So what's settling at certain periods of time um, and during for certain periods of the year, which can also um, change what methods the oyster farmers would have to use to deal with these um, the barnacles on their equipment. Certain barnacles have like different strengths and weaknesses that they would have to change their methods for. And also because of the, um, the Cape Cod Canal's existence in these last hundred years, new species would be, are being introduced to the Cape Cod Bay area that they would not have uh, had such easy access to originally. So I, um, it was also interesting to look into that. Now, these are on the right, you can see um, the, um, what it, biofiling by barnacles looks like. Like you can imagine just touching that, it looks gross. You might actually just <laughs> cut yourself and like just op to open that even, you probably have to like scrape a lot of them away. 
So it would be very useful to not have to deal with that. And on the left two slides, you can see us at the um, Davenport Oyster Farm uh, collecting our samples and our sediment plates from there. Now, a little bit of background on barnacles themselves. Barnacles, um, they might not look interesting, but they have a very interesting life cycle. And um, I'm excited to talk about them. Um, they have a two-stage uh, life cycle, their adult sessile phase and their um, young planktonic phase. Um, they start out, uh, they go from eggs to these uh, noplii. <laughs> and the, um, and the noplii are um, what really moves around and um, tries to get from where they are to uh, where they're going. They follow currents and such. And then from noplii, they become uh, the sippers, the things on the right. And those look for places to settle in um, like good areas to become sessile in, that they can stay still for long periods of time and still have food. And from there, they go into their um, sessile phase. They, settle down, attach, become juvenile uh, barnacles or metamorphs. And from there, they grow their shell out and become the true adults that we see all over uh, the beaches today. Now, um, um, so um, barnacles also, like something interesting about them is that they are um, the first settlers down at a new habitat. They can um, head there and they can sort of create an area for other species to um, settle down in. Um, algae can be attached to them, as well as uh, crabs that eat them in uh, snails. So they're very useful for um, just creating a area in a, um, an area that new species can settle down and um, proliferate in. Now there are about five total barnacle species, well, five common uh, barnacle species on Cape Cod but two that are common on the shore that you have all seen. The Cathamelus fragilis, the little brown barnacle, and the semibalanus balanoides, or the northern acorn barnacle. Um, the northern acorn barnacle um, usually stays up above um, the Cape Cod area and can go down below all the way to, I believe, the Delaware River, <laughs> while the Cathamelus, or the little brown barnacle, is actually uses the, um, uses Cape Cod as sort of the arm of Cape Cod as its barrier point. Um, it, nothing can go past here, um, or no barnacles have gone past here for the most part, but with the Cape Cod Canal's creation, it should have um, been spreading more because it can survive in these warmer waters now that um, global warming has started affecting the earth in the ways it has. Now, to get what we actually needed, the, um, the data and the samples, um, putting down the settler, we put down uh, sediment plates and collected them weekly. Uh, the sediment plates were basically just um, PVC plates that we could attach to a rock, some areas, and um, collect the barnacle settlers on there and record what we found and um, preserve some a subset of settlers for later. Um, we took samples from uh, the local a local spot, Park Street, uh, just down the road here. It's a uh, rocky area. We also took it from up here, the Dennis Oyster Farm, which is on a massive uh, sand flat on the Cape Cod Bay area. And also from the, um, the uh, Fairhaven Oyster Farm, um, which is a actually floating farm. So it's um, subtitle instead of intertitle, which is how the majority of um, oyster farms actually function outside of Cape Cod. That's, um, so we had a wide range of things to choose from. And there is our um, Park Street site. Now, to go from actually just getting the, um, the settlers to figuring out what they were, um, they're not super easy to identify just by looking at. So we needed to do an actual DNA process to discover what it is that we were looking at and what uh, species appeared during each spike or um, settlement period. So once we had the samples from the plates, we would um, distract their DNA using a um, using a Kelex solution, which are just these small beads that would um, we would put into a solution with um, the sample, um, put it through a process of just um, heating it up, and then um, 
destroying basically the the sample so completely that like all the um, DNA was just left in the liquid and then spun down. So all of the solid helix beads would be brought down and all of the um, nice DNA liquid that we would like is up at the top. Um, however, we wouldn't really get that much DNA just from that process. It's a small sample. So we would run it through something called a polymerase chain reaction or a PCR regularly called. Um, and what that does is it um, allows DNA to grow and to um, have like a much bigger presence in the liquid. Um, and um, when you're doing that, well, samples will be preserved for a long time and you don't know if the process you ran through is working exactly. So we would run it through something called a agarose gel electrophesis, which is used to confirm which samples were viable. Um, and a viable sequence, the samples that were viable were sent out to be uh, sequenced later for um, further identification. Now, uh, what did we get from this? Now, the um, we got a, a large peak from um, Dennis and the Park Street sites, and we know those to be semi-balanous balanoides or the northern acorn barnacles. Um, however, the majority of the other um, sediment peaks are still unknown. Um, the Cathamulus fragilis. Um, we expected to find it in the Cape Cod barrier since it has had a hundred years to put down a foothold in. And it, we have known that it can survive in the Cape Cod Bay waters in the temperature and um, habitat that exists north of Cape Cod has only grown better and better for it. However, um, we have not found that it um, exists in a large presence in the Cape Cod Bay side. It is very rare if we ever find it. So that is something that I, um, in the rest of our lab, do not know and are very interested to find out the reasons behind. Um, also, with our new, um, with new graph, we have a more accurate sediment period timeline, which can be given to the, um, to the oyster farmers and allow them to have a better, more accurate way to predict when the barnacles are going to settle and what they can do to sort of mitigate that and control their um, the biofiling that occurs in the farms. So from the, um, the Park Street, which was a rocky intertidal zone, you can see that there's one massive uh, spike in the sediment that occurs um, in the winter periods, um, I think. Okay. Um, and that is known to be uh, semi-balanous um, balanoides, the northern acorn barnacle. Um, so we know because of this that it likes to settle mainly in those colder months and then just sort of uh, settle out. Um, also in um, June, we have seen that it also, we have uh, also sequenced the DNA and found that semi-balanous also appears um, during that little peak right there. So it's interesting because um, it doesn't just choose one period of time to settle in, it sort of spreads things out, but it does have that one massive peak that you can see. For the um, Dennis Port, the Dennis site or the Davenport Oyster Farm, um, we took it from a uh, sand flat or so big sandy area on the Cape Cod Bay. Um, we found that most species here were uh, semi-balanous um, and that the um, and the um, the big peak you can see here, um, but we do not know what these other peaks are yet. We have not gone to that. Um, we have we are in the process of sequencing the DNA and figuring out what it is. Um, but that is information we will glean uh, after my internship here. And then the um, Fairhaven West Island Oyster Farm data. So this is taken from, again, a subtitle oyster farm, which is like the norm. So it's something that we really want information on if we want to interest um, oyster farmers from you know, all over uh, America and everywhere that um, these type of oyster, these type of barnacles exist. So it's really good that we had this. 
Um, you can see that like the Thamelis Semivalinus settlement in the winter is actually lower than in the um, other two sites. And this is probably because of A, the location, it was in the Buzzards Bay area rather than on the uh, Cape Cod and B, because it was subtitled, so it most likely was cooler. It was always submerged. So that likely had a large role in it. Um, uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank um, my mentor, Dr. Jesus Pineda, Jane Weinstock, who was companion, um, the farms that let us go there, um, the Carolyn Tiefold and Lauren Stevenson, who were very kind about letting us use their lab area. Um, all the brave barnacles that gave their lives. <laughs> um, Monet and Angele, you, thank you so much. This has been uh, such a pleasant experience and it really could have been a bad one if you weren't so pleasant. Um, <laughs> um, and my entire cohort, of course. Um, so many things happened and I had to include some pictures. Uh, here's us looking for the, the families and the tide pools and um, my men in my postdoc uh, talking with Jonathan uh, with the interview. Um, <laughs> us at the campfire, us looking through the tide pools and finding uh, interesting creatures and uh, us on the Kramer and my favorite picture of my mentor uh, showing us the whale barnacle, <laughs> which I wish I could go into, but I just don't have the time. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, Cam. All right, so you're saying that barnacles are very early successors in um, ecological succession happening. Mm -hmm. Which one of the barnacle species mm -hmm. would show up first? Well, that depends on where you are geographically. Um, the thamelis shows up higher in the intertidal zone because it, um, because it is more resistant to heat, um, but it is capable of living in the lower areas. Um, it's just that like the uh, northern acorn barnacle sort of um, competes with it and kind of presses it out. So I would say most likely the little brown barnacle, the Cathamelus, would show up first in a new habitat in this area and then would be, you know, um, a lot of other things to live there, like algae and the, um, you know, shrimp that eat those and the crabs and the snails, you know, that starts an entire chain of other things that could successfully habitate there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Esmeralda. Um, how much like barnacles would you find on average on these Um, a whole average is actually sort of hard because we would have periods where we would find nothing, and then periods where we would find hundreds on a plate. So I don't know to average it out, probably like ten. Um, <laughs> but that math really means nothing. <laughs> Um, I am done. Thank you all so much. <laughs>
and then there at Vegas River in Maine. Some background about Atlantic salmon. They are a naturalist fish, which means they are born in fresh water. They migrate to the ocean and then return to spawn in their natal river. They can be found in North America, Ireland, Greenland, Europe, and Russia. And this bottom portion of, let's see, The bottom portion of the map there has actually disappeared. Um, they can only be found in a few rivers in Maine now in North America. They have been on the endangered species list since the year 2000, and their main threats are dams, pollution, overfishing, and climate change. Atlantic salmon go through many different life stages. So they start as eggs and then they turn into aelvin where they are still feeding off of their yolk sac. Once they have consumed that, they swim out of their nest and turn into fry. They then turn into par and then when they are ready to migrate into the ocean, they transform into smolt. Smolt are the focus of our study and the definition of a smolt is a young salmon after the par stage when it becomes silvery and migrates to the sea for the first time. So one of the conservation efforts for this endangered species is a conservation hatchery program. There's two federal Atlantic salmon hatcheries in Maine and they raise salmon for rivers with critically low populations. They are river specific programs. So whatever parents the fish are bred from, they're placed back into that river. And they release the fish back into the wild at different life stages. Some of them are put back in as eggs, some as par, smolt, and sometimes even adult. And this is just to increase the overall chance of survival. One of the conservation hatchery programs is the Peter Gray Par Project. This is a conservation hatchery run by the Downey Salmon Federation, which is a nonprofit organization. Peter Gray is actually a British fisheries biologist who used unique and innovative techniques, which resulted in one of the most impressive restoration Atlantic salmon programs in history. He actually trained other biologists at this hatchery, and the samples that we used for our study were actually raised in this hatchery. Some of the techniques that make this hatchery so unique are that they incorporate river water from the natal rivers and they imitate a natural red. A red is just a salmon nest. And as you can see in the top right picture, they spawn in between the rocks. So this hatchery uses rocky substrates to imitate this natural nest in their takes. They have a strength conditioning program. So they increase the flow of the water as the fish grow to imitate the salmon is swimming upstream. They are clipped for identification. So in later surveys, we know that these fish came from this hatchery. They stock them in lower temperatures to ensure they survive. And they do paint their tanks black, again, to imitate a natural environment. I just wanted to highlight some of the difference between wild fish and hatchery fish. So wild fish are aged by year, they have less uniform lines on their scales and they were easier to age, at least in this study. Hatchery fish are aged by the months after being put back into the river and they have uniform lines on their scales. They are harder to age because a stocking mark, which is the point at which they're released back into the wild may look like an extra year. And we do use fish scales to age salmon. Most fish are aged using otoliths, which are fish ear bones. And we can't do that because they are an endangered species, so we can't kill them. And as you can see, these pictures probably look almost the same to you, but they are different fish and they are from different origins. And there's currently no software that can age them. So we are trying to age them by hand, essentially. So this is just a timeline of the lifespan of the samples we used for our study. So the top timeline is going to be a naturally reared or a wild fish, and the bottom is a hatchery fish. And those letters just correspond to months, so January, February, March, and so on. And as you can see, for wild fish, they were in the river from 2020, where they were spawned, up until 
about the middle of 2023. And then the green boxes you can see is when they transform into smolts, which again is the life stage where they're ready to go out into the ocean. The hatchery fish were actually in the hatchery at first, and then they were put into the wild. So they were in the wild for about a year and a half to acclimate um, before they were ready to go out to sea. And so we wanted to see how this difference in environment was affecting their growth. So our research question was, how are two-year-old hatchery origin smolt growing compared to wild origin smolt? We focused on the past year's growth from 2022 to 2023, and we used a subset of 30 of each origin, 30 wild and 30 hatchery from the Narragwigas River, Little Falls location. On this map, you can see the Narragwigas River has two different sampling sites. We used the lower one in red. So in order to compare the growth, we first had to figure out the age of the fish. And the scale right here shows five different, the microscopic slide, sorry, shows five different scales. This is just one fish and that's the real life size. This picture at the top is just one scale. We had to image up to four of these to come to a consensus on what their age was. And this year we had to go through about four rounds of audits on aging because the scales were really difficult to age this year. We did this for 167 different fish. We randomly selected 60 individuals for measuring, 30 wild, 30 hatchery, and we measured their scale features using Image Pro software as well as length and weight data to compare their growth. So this is salmon scale anatomy. Each little marker you see here is one of the scale features we measured. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but those little flags are each a uh, marker. And so the center of the scale is called the focus. Each individual ring you see is an individual circulus. So just like trees grow rings for every year, fish scales are similar. They grow a few rings per year. And so you can see the first annulus would be the first year and the second annulus would be their second year. In the winter, the circulus are closer together and in the summer, they are farther apart. We used a NOVA statistical test to compare these features between the different small origins. So we were able to measure the distance between each ring with the software. And we primarily looked at variance between wild and hatchery origin fish to see if there were any differences. We used a p-value of 0.05 to determine whether results were statistically significant or not. This is our ANOVA results summary. So we looked at fork length, weight, and fish condition, which is just an equation that takes into account both length and weight. And none of those results were statistically significant. We also looked at second year growth, second year circulus count, and first year growth, and those were significant. So for fork length here, you can see the graph on your left. Um, the y-axis is the length, the x-axis is origin. So the red-orange box plot is the naturally reared or wild fish, and the blue box plot is the parsoft or hatchery fish. And while there's a visible difference in length here, it was not statistically significant. The p-value of 0 0.06 is, however, very borderline. So while there's no statistically significant sound, it is possible that there is a biological significance. On the graph on the right, we looked at condition factor. And again, they're pretty similar. So no statistical significance was found. <coughs> When we looked at second year growth overall, the graph on the right, we did see that wild fish had more growth their second year. And this was measured using the distance between the first and second annulus. On the bottom graph, we looked at the number of circuli in the second year. And again, there was more growth in the wild fish. So both graphs had a p-value below 0 0.05, denoting statistical significance and difference between the fish. Wild fish have increased overall growth and number of circuli in the second year when compared to hatchery fish. 
Lastly, we looked at the first year growth. So this was calculated using the distance from the focus to the first annulus, which was standardized um, to account for different fish sizes. And for the first year growth, we actually found that hatchery fish had more growth. So overall, growth was faster for wild fish in the second year, but slower in the first year. The hatchery fish actually had more growth in their first year, and this can be attributed to environmental differences in diet. Hatchery fish are constantly fed pellets in their hatchery environment for their first year, which is why they can be growing faster. And also the stress associated with transitioning from the hatchery to the wild requires more energy, which slows their growth in the second year as well. Overall, there was not many statistically significant differences found, which shows the conservation hatchery efforts appear to be producing similar smolts, which is good because their goal is to produce par that are able to survive just as well as wild fish. And this showed us that the smolts are entering the marine environments in similar conditions. Some future steps we take with this would be to increase our sample size, include multiple years, do an in-depth study of the first year growth, and look at growth over a longer period of time and possibly look at returning adults. I'd like to acknowledge my mentor, Ruth Hass Castro, who taught me everything I know about fisheries and salmon, Brandon Ellingson, who helped with a lot of the data and graphs, the Partnership Education Program, the Atlantic Salmon Ecosystem Research Team, and the Peter Gray Hatchery Main Department of Marine Resources and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which all helped with the samples that we used for this study. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? about the, um, the scale anatomy. How do you know how many rings there are per year? There, I'm going to avoid that. So there's not an actual number of per year. Each fish varies. Um, so it depends on how fast they're growing. But you're able to um, so like when you see the scales start having more space between them, you know that's the end of a year. Um, and it took a long time to be able to just do that by looking at it. So you really have to be trained. <laughs> yes. Do you have an idea what the survivorship of the first and second year fish are? I am not sure of an exact number, but there's only about a thousand Atlantic salmon returning to their rivers every year. So it's very, very low. Are there any efforts going into the machine learning to try to find scales? Yes. I don't know how far along they are. My mentor just went to a conference on that. Um, but it's probably going to be a while. Why are the scales closer to the inferior parts? Um, so they grow closer when the fish is growing closer, or, sorry, growing faster. So it lays down rings as it grows. So in the winter, they're growing more than in the summer. Sorry, that's the other way around. <laughs> Cam, sorry, I know you had your hand up. I did not. Okay. Our next presenter is Mr. Cameron Johnson.
right, everybody. All right, so my name is Cameron Johnson. I attend the beautiful uh, Bethune Cookman University in Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, I'm a rising senior, and uh, this is my project on assessing spatial and temporal variation in copper pottery production in the Gulf of Maine. It's a mouthful, so we're going to call it economics. <laughs> All right, so a little background. This project that I'm doing is an offshoot. It's a very, it's a very small part of a larger project being a headed by Ann Tarrant of Hui, and her project is on mixotrophy and how mixotrophic organisms play, a, what role that they play in the marine ecosystem. Um, this is the marine ecosystem of the Gulf of Maine. Uh, if you look towards the bottom, you see your things that live on the bottom, and you see, you know, things organized by the water column. And uh, if you focus on phytoplankton and zooplankton, a lot of things eat them, and a lot of things need them to survive. Um, a lot of our economically significant species like our lobster, our swordfish, our tuna, cod, mackerel. Um, they rely on the smaller organisms that we don't really think about too much. So even if you're looking at it from a pure, purely economical standpoint, it's very, very important to know how the food chain interacts with each other. So what is a mixotroph? I've said it a few times already, but a very quick rundown on what a mixotroph is. A mixotroph is, an, is a plankton that can photosynthesize to make energy or it could eat other things to make it to, to get energy. So not a lot is known about how mixotrophs even being there affects um, the things that may eat them. And this is because the fact that they have two ways of getting energy and um, feeding themselves, they could have a different nutrient load than ob obligate phototrophs or obligate phagotrophs. Um, so this project aims to investigate their role in the food chain by investigating two of the animals that are most likely to eat them. They're copepods called Centropides typicus and Calanus and Marchicus. All right, so how exactly would we even identify the role of mixotrophic organisms in the, in the diet of those copepods? So you sample some copepods. You also sample the community from the water that those copepods were living in. You, de you analyze the DNA of the sample of the community sample while also analyzing the gut content of the copepod. Um, if you look here, that's the entrails. Um, with the blue glove is pointing out, those are the copepod's entrails. And the plan is to analyze their gut content and um, compare it to what's in the community. That way we can find out what the copepods are eating. And since and since what copepods are eating are likely to vary throughout time and space, we can make connections with what the variations in time and space means for the egg and their body size data. So these are our subjects of study. Just a little more details on Centropogies typicus and Calanus finmarticus. Calanus is typically found in the North Atlantic, sometimes around the Arctic. Um, they're larger than typicus, and they're more elongated, and they have a streamlined body. They're ocean going. Centropides typicus is a little more inland, so they have a compact body, they're smaller, and they're found in temperate waters. So copepods are an ideal subject for this, for this study for a few reasons. They're abundant in the Gulf of Maine. They're really sensitive to ecological changes. They reproduce fast. If we're looking at reproduction, we'd hope it wouldn't take forever. And they have a variable growth rate, as well as being major grazers of phytoplankton. Um, so we're looking at something that photosynthesizes like phytoplankton and something that eats phytoplankton would be a good subject for that. Our main research objectives are finding out if there's a difference in reproductive output across months, across stations. Um, we also would like to know what role copepod body size plays in reproductive output. This is our area of observation. Um, we sailed out of Portsmouth, Maine. We sailed into the Wilkinson Basin, and that's why our stations are named WB2, WB4, and WB7. That stands for Wilkinson Basin. So for water sampling, a CTD, um, it collects CTD data, which is conductivity, temperature, and depth. Conductivity is a way to calculate salinity of water. And it was suspended from an A-frame by the Gulf Challenger crew, and they raised and lowered it, lowered it as we needed. On the surface, Surface water was taken and water from the deep chlorophyll maximum was taken, and that was to stock assess phytoplankton. 
additional seawater was also taken for you know, lab use, additional experiments. Using a plankton net connected to the A-frame, copepods were collected as well as the community uh, around the copepods, some zoo and phytoplankton from the community. The net contents were put into a jar filled with formalin and another net's contents were filled were in a jar with ethanol. And that's important because the formalin filled jar is to preserve anatomical structure so we can study morphology, size of the copepods, but ethanol is used to preserve the genetic material of the community and we need both of those. Field processing and storage was pretty straightforward as well. Some specimens were preserved as soon as possible, but others were stored live in chilled seawater in a cooler so that we could observe them while they were alive. Specimens were sorted by species and sex, and females of both species were set aside at eight degrees Celsius for 24 hours to lay eggs. Eight degrees Celsius is about the temperature of the water that we sampled them from, so we wanted to emulate that for those 24 hours that they were incubating. So for the Centropodes and Calanus egg counts, after the 24 hours it elapsed, the egg contents were swirled around in a scintillation bottle to get them stuck from the walls. They were put into a glass Petri dish and I looked under a microscope and counted them by hand with a hand counter and a pipette. For Finmarticus, since it was the only one that we were gonna measure its length under a microscope, um, those were also positioned um, all facing the same direction to be taken uh, photographs of at 16X. I also used a 10 millimeter, I mean, 10 millimeter micrometer as a reference to see what their links was, what their links were. Images were measured using a software called ImageJ and the data from the egg counts and the measurements was imported to R. And once in R, I plotted the data and performed statistical analysis. So what did we find? First off, these graphs, huge asterisks by them because April is the only month that we got all three sites. Only WB2 was sampled in June and only WB7 was sampled in July. Um, more on that later, but for now, um, I just want to explain um, this, these two graphs here. Um, we got so many zeros for July that anything other than zero looks like a statistical anomaly. So I used a violin graph to sort of explain distribution and probability. We got so many zeros for July, the green one, that the band is super thick by zero. But you can see for April, our most robust data set, it looks pretty even all throughout until you get to the extremely high number. So further examination of April, since it's our most substantial data set, data, data set shows that there wasn't much variation between stations in April, but our, our data was consistent with the results of another paper, the Runge et al paper. And they both show in April that there are about 50 eggs per female per day late. And that's important because being able to replicate that shows that conditions in the Gulf of Maine in April are just right to support 50 eggs per female per day. And that could be for a number of reasons, like a spawning event or a phytoplankton. We don't know. It needs further study. So this is Calanus egg production by station. Um, all of the months are consolidated for the reason that I said earlier that we didn't get as much data as we wanted. So here's how, here's how well, first I'll go into Centropogy's egg count since April is the only month that we got Centropogy's eggs. For WB2, we got a very high number of eggs and it dropped off severely in WB2 and there are even less eggs in WB7. But this is exactly what you'd expect since Centropogy's is found more inshore and WB2, as you can see, is our closest to shore. So for Calanus, the ANOVA showed that there wasn't much statistical difference between station uh, across all months. But when, but when size of the female and eggs are uh, added to the equation, you can see that um, there may be a slight correlation looking at WB7. So copepod reproductive output may not be directed, directed directly affected by one parable, one, I'm sorry, it may not be directly affected by one parameter like space or time, but rather it's a function of space, time, size of the female, and um, you can sort of see that in WB, WB7. We don't really have a lot of data. We have maybe a third of the data that we were really looking for. So it's not a smoking gun, but it definitely puts our foot in the door to investigate further. 
So here's our, here's a few errors. I'm not gonna read them all to you, but as you can see, not a lot. Um, there were a lot of things that went wrong. There were a lot of things that went right, uh, which is why I was able to get the graph in the last, in the last slide. But um, again, take everything with a massive grain of salt. Um, there has to be more studies conducted and I, all right, so our next steps. Uh, further investigation of copepod gut content using DNA barcoding and amplifying prey DNA that hasn't been done yet. Um, and you know, that's still something that needs to be done. Further examination of copepods that didn't lay eggs because um, Anne and her lab, they're looking into maybe opening up those copepods and seeing whether they had eggs and didn't drop them. So further investigation into the stress factors that might've led to them not laying eggs when they had them internally is also being looked into. And again, more sampling cruises. If you get more data behind you, the statistical anomalies and you know the errors, they start to matter less when you have a bigger bank of data behind you. Um, I wanna say a special thanks to HUI, to NSF, the PEP program, and everybody on this list. Um, there were highs, there were lows this summer, but it's the culmination of my summer and I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned that WB2 was further inland than your other sites. Were there any other differences between your sites that led you to choose them to study in the first place? Well, the differences in site, there were so many. Sometimes there were there was different um, fluorescence for sites. That means like uh, different different types and different uh, levels of certain phytoplankton. There is different. There's small variations in salinity. Uh, their temperature variations and WB2 is actually the, the farthest inland. So it's the shallowest site. And um, yeah, there, there were so many differences. I couldn't add them all because it was a really large chart, but that variation, the, the sites were picked because of, you know, variation. Yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> hey, you thought she was going to get away? I did. Absolutely <laughs> 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 One last question. Yes. You said that the uh, sampling coefficient went up and said, you said, you suggested that there should be more. What happened on those cruises that the data was not sufficient? Well, on one cruise, there was bad weather. So one site could only be visited. And on another cruise, the CTD broke. So samples, sufficient samples couldn't be taken. There was another cruise and the net broke. So um, it's just technical difficulties, uh, human error, non-human error. It's, these things happen, life happens. How long was that? Uh, typical cruise was um, two, two or three days, two, two or three days, yeah. The one that I went on, I was there for two days. Anybody else? All right. Our next speaker, Ms. Julia Hill. Hello everyone, my name is Julia Hill and I'll be talking about the research that I did this summer with my mentor, Dr. Chris Sherwood, who can be here with us in person today, um, but it was under USGS and together we measured the crystal change through photogrammetry. 
So just a little background on what coastal change is. It is essentially just the changing of coastlines via erosion or accretion or eroding or depositing sand on the beach. And some of these processes that affect both erosion and accretion are wave and wind driven currents, wave breaking and overwash. Uh, the process I'll be specifically looking at is called alien transport, which is where the wind picks up sediment on the beach and uh, moves it further back along the beach. And so you can see in this picture here, there's a little tiny sand dune and the dune is accreted because it is being trapped by the vegetation underneath it. So for my research project, I looked at Head of the Meadow Beach, which is in Truro, Massachusetts, along the Outer Cape, and is also part of Cape Cod National Seashore. Some of the features at this beach are that there are tall bluffs with smaller sand dunes in front of it. And on top of these bluffs are a camera, which is a partnership between the National Park Service and USGS uh, to take pictures at this beach to look at different aspects. Uh, there's also a sandbar located about 330 meters offshore, and this beach itself has low coastal vulnerability because of uh, the features at the beach. So in this left picture up here, you see just how tall the bluffs are. They're about 20 meters or 60 feet tall to give you some more perspective on how high they are. And there's a tiny arrow pointing to where the camera would be if you could see it. And then on the picture on the right is an actual picture taken from the camera last Friday. Um, and it's just one of two uh, points that you can see from the camera and it's looking down at the beach. So for my project, I wanted to measure the vertical change of sand dunes at Head of the Meadow Beach. Uh, there is an observational change in the vegetation on the beach through satellite imagery, um, but I wanted to see if I could quantify how much was actually there. And so you'll see in these next few pictures, a time series from 2015 to 2023, looking at how the vegetation has changed. So in this square box here in 2015, there's little to no vegetation. And then in 2019, you have some sparse vegetation going in front of the bluffs. In 2021, all of the vegetation has gone away. And then here we are in 2023 with the dense strip of vegetation. Uh, and just for reference, there's the parking lot on the left side and this rectangle is about half a kilometer wide. So for my project, I looked at software or structure for motion photogrammetry and I used the software I just saw Metashape. And so what structure for motion is, is it takes these 2D images on the left and turns it into a 3D model, which is seen on the right. And this is my first mini project, just to familiarize myself with the software. And so I took about 30 pictures from different angles of this rock to make this model. And when you take the images from the different angles, you get to the software looks at the camera geometry so that it understands which part of the picture goes where and actually gets it to a pretty accurate model as you can see there. So before I could even make the model of the beach, uh, my mentor along with other people at USGS had to go out into the field to take the pictures. And in order for these pictures to work within the software, there has to be certain settings that can't change on the camera so that um, it's not confusing. And some of these settings are focal length and object distance, which focal length measures the zoom in and out on a picture, and that can mess up um, the orientation of the image it's taking, and object distance, which kind of does the same thing. If the camera is closer or further away from a certain aspect, uh, the figures or images won't look the same, they'll be disoriented. And then aperture ISO and shutter speed also have to be the same because those affect how much light is being taken in on the pictures, and you don't want your pictures overexposed or under underexposed. And then there also needs to be a 75% overlap of all of the images so that the software can detect the same features in multiple images. And for this project, I looked from 2020 to 2023. And for each of the maps, uh, 1,600 images were collected at most with about an average of 1,000. So in this picture, you can see my mentor looking and setting up the contraption for the camera, and then someone's looking at the settings on the camera, and that green box kind of above his shoulder is the GPS that takes the photo locations of each photo. And so on the left here, you see that what the actual contraption looks like. Uh, we have the helium-filled kite or heli kite that has the camera dangling from it, and then the helium tank lifts up the kite to a certain elevation so that it stays the same throughout the entire uh, path. And then 
someone has to take this helikite and walk it all the way up and down the beach. So on this image on the right, in the light blue is the path taken from 2023, and in the dark blue behind it is the path taken from 2020. And each of those, pic each of those dots is a single picture taken. So now it's time to get into what I did for making the models. So I process all of these images using 4D, which takes images from multiple collections or multiple years. In my case, I used 2020 and 2023 to get an overall average of how much accretion occurred on the beach. And um, yeah, so I first aligned the images together to make a sparse cloud. And that took many of the points together and essentially what this does it is aligns the software looks and finds unique points in every single picture and makes them into a point as you can see up here so on this top left image that is the sparse cloud and then you have to go through many steps to reduce the air and it turns into a dense cloud right here with more points um, and that is one of the products that i created because each of those points has a specific color and X, Y, and Z location from the photo locations on that GPS that I just mentioned. However, those are not extremely accurate because there's about a one meter error in there. So we had to add ground control points in. And this down here is the ground control point that was put onto the beach and it's called an error point. And what it does is it's extremely accurate down to about approximately three centimeters. So when that's placed on the beach, the cameras can pick up the markers and all the different dots on the uh, map there. And since it is extremely accurate, um, it just gives us less air for the map itself. And so some of the products are two of the final products that I made from Structure for Motion in Agisoft Metashape were an ortho mosaic, which is a very detailed image of the beach, a very detailed map of the beach, and a digital elevation model or den. And the den you can see is right here. And so now that I've made these models, my mentor and I wanted to ask ourselves, how accurate are these models? And so one source of error that we looked at was from the ground control points. And in Agisoft Metashape, it showed us that the total error after going through many steps to reduce it was an average of 0 0.2, 0 0.02 meters or two centimeters. And this just shows that we can rely on our maps to uh, differentiate between two different years and the maps are remarkably accurate. So I then added in the DEMS into what's called Global Mapper. And essentially what I did was I created a DEM for each year and placed them on top of each other to see the change in elevation from each year. And so in purple, you can see is the tall bluffs and then going down the beach to the green is the berm. So purple is high elevation and green is low elevation. And after you place all of those DEMs on top of each other, you can create what is called a path profile. And seen in this figure up here on the right, you can see that in purple in 2020, it had the lowest elevation going across shore distance. And then in 2023, it had the highest looking at the dense vegetation area. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, you can also create a difference map from the DEMS. And so I took 2020 and 2023's digital elevation models and placed them on top of each other. And a difference map essentially shows where the greatest accretion and erosion was on the map. So in blue, we have accretion rates, and then in red right here, we have erosion rates. And I took those and I made them into contour lines and placed them against the ortho mosaic to see exactly where the greatest accretion and erosion was. And so you can see along here is also right here where there's the most accretion, and that's in the dense vegetation strip. So now that we've seen where it's been accreted and there has been actual accretion and elevation change on the beach, I wanted to calculate how much accretion was or quantify, actually, actually give numbers to it. So I took all of these three boxes and averaged the amount of deposition of sand over the three bands. And so what we got was a 0.3 meter deposition between all three of the bands. And since we have that average, I wanted to look at where that was mostly concentrated. So in the first band, which is in green here, 
Uh, that's the one closest to the bluff with sparse vegetation that has only about a 0.1 meter uh, deposition of sand. And then in the band two in purple, that has a 0.7 meter deposition of sand. Um, and that's where the dense vegetation is. And then in this yellowish orange box here, that's the that models the berm of the beach, which is the most dynamic part. And that has the most uh, accretion at 0.75 meters. So I then wanted to see where exactly all of the, or when the sand was deposited onto each of these beaches. So I plotted uh, the path profiles and I added in each of the bands where they should have been against the profile. So you can see where the green one is, most of the sand was accreted evenly between 2020 and 2022. And then in purple, most of it was accreted uh, between 2020 and 2021 because you have, you have that large jump right in here. And then uh, the orange is highly dynamic and changes a lot because that is the berm of the beach. So you have a lot of tides coming in and out and also waves breaking and crashing and bringing sand onto the shore and also eroding it off. And so you might be asking, why is all this important? Well, 24% of the 24% of the beaches worldwide are currently eroding, and 27% are accreting. So more, more are accreting than eroding right now. However, with sea level rising, erosion rates are likely to increase, and the amount or the percentage of beaches eroding will also likely increase. So Modeling accreting beaches is important for future management of beaches, and it's good to understand the processes of both an eroding and accreting beaches in order to model them. And for me personally, the most direct uh, use would be calculating an aeolian transport model. And what that does is it takes how wet the sand is, how long the beach is itself, um, wind data, wave data, uh, to calculate how much sand is being blown onto the beach from alien transport. And so in conclusion, satellite imagery showed us that there is an increase of vegetation on head of the meadow beach. So I created 3D models using Agisoft Metashape and Global Mapper to quantify the amount of sand that was on the beach. There was a range of 0.1 to 0.7 meters of sand that was deposited with an average of 0.3 over the entire beach. And for my future steps, I would love to continue to look ahead of them at a beach and see if the accretion rates change or if it would start to erode. And then, like I said earlier, calibrate an alien transport model looking at wind, wind data, grain size, moisture of sand, width of the beach, and the vegetation density. I would really like to thank all of these people and all of these programs up here because they were the driving force behind my entire summer, both in the lab and outside. And thank you. Do you guys have any questions? Miles. Uh, I was working with the, the modeling program. It seems really difficult for it. Um, so one of my mini mentors, I like to call her, her name was Jim C. Over. She wrote an entire um, book, or not book, but paper on how to use this software. And so between Jinsey and my mentor, Dr. Sherwood, they really helped me understand all the difficult parts because I ran into problems at almost every step, but they were there to help me figure it out. And also they were really good about letting me try and figure it out on my own first. So I appreciate it for that. I have a question from online. Were there any significant weather events during your study period that might have influenced your results? So from what I recall that my mentor had told me, they one of the data sets was from February of 2021 and the rest was in March of 2021. I believe that was because the weather was better just a little bit earlier that year, but I don't think there was any crazy like storms that happened or nor'easters during that time. I could be wrong, but that is that is from my memory. But correct. Yes. Okay. Do you know why uh, uh, this kite was used instead of a drone? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So because we were on a national park or Cape Cod National Seashore, drones are not allowed on government property. Um, they do use uh, planes when they do this over other areas that aren't government property. 
and it's a lot faster, I've been told. Um, but yeah, they had to figure out how to use the healing pipe instead of the drum. Thank you. Forgive me, you all were having a little bit of technical difficulties. Our next presenter is Mr. Blaze Miles. part of Louis, work for the Marine Policy Center. And I'm an up and coming sophomore at University of Illinois at Brandon Champaign. And my wonderful mentor over there, Dr. Hauka Kai Pao, me have collaborated on the research that I've been doing this whole summer, which is about decarbonization of the maritime industry. So let's get to it. So I'm rattling the issue. Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm rattling the issue. To first understand the issue, we've got to understand what is maritime. The maritime industry is basically the shipping industry, such as daily commerce that has been going on for decades and is a billion dollar industry that's traded between companies and countries even. And the issue with this, as many of y'all may or may not know, is that they produce a lot of carbon emissions. So much as the global Global greenhouse gas emissions is 3%, which may not seem like a lot, but our goal is to reach down to zero emissions, which any, anything that can reduce that would be helpful. So 
as ways we can be able to fix this is adding, making these things more fuel efficient and adding fuel tax, which we would get into the shifts that we were working with. Um, working with our shifts, as you can see on the left, is the VLCC tanker or very large food carrier, or sometimes called as an oil tanker. It's one of the most common used ships that throughout our society that has been around since the 1871 when it was first created. And it's a liquid boat carrier, so it carries such things as hazardous chemicals and petroleum and gasoline, but usually it carries oil. And it can store up to 2 million barrels of oil, which is a lot. And then also the average cost is 100 million, but that's thing it depends on the condition, how old or how new it is, such as a car. And that's thing, it can range it up to 150 million. So it really depends. And then also it has a 91,000 91, charter rate, which is basically 91,000 per day is usually the average cost on how much it makes. And then as you can see on the right side, that's a Neo Panamax or a Panamax and it's a dry bulk carrier. So it carries things such as coal, salt, iron ore, things that are dry cargo. And the average cost is 25 million, but just such as the oil tanker, it depends on the type of condition it's in and other factors such as that. And then also it has a $20,000 charter rate or 20,000 per day, which varies between most of the things. And the BLCC tanker uh, burns 50 tons of oil per day, which is a lot. And then the Panamax roughly burns around 25 tons of oil per day. And with these huge ships burning oil, so much oil and consume so much fuel, what are ways we can make it fuel efficient? Sails and ducts. Um, as you can see on the left side is the flatter rotor are the two are the four poles sticking out the ship. And it varies from five, four, three, two, one. And uh, it depends on how many is on the ship. And it works as the aerodynamics use the huge poles to spin and such as a wind turbine, it saves and build energy. And it was developed in 1922 or 1922. And uh, it's constantly being more advanced and more as technology improves, such as the rotors. And there's also multiple types of sales, such as Rizmo um, by the Mission Tire Company. They created an inflatable sail, which is half the price of the flat rotor, but a lot of these things are still in prototype because this is such a relatively new thing being introduced into the industry. And as you can see, it says 10 more times more efficient than conventional sales, which is very accurate because as it would take a lot of manpower to even start steering the sale, as some of you may know on the Kramer that we did. Uh, the average cost is 2.8 million. It costs 2 million to ship, to create, and then it costs $800,000 to ship. And it varies on type of ship and on the size. And then the fuel savings is actually on the high end of things. So fuel savings is 10 to 12%, which is a lot because there's not many ways to make ships fuel efficient very high without taking a huge impact. Then on the right, you can see the ducted propeller or the weight flow duct. And it's uh, developed in 1931, and it helps helps the ship flow more smoothly through water to where it doesn't have to consume and take too much energy and use up too much fuel to uh, steer and flow. And the average cost is 250000 to 400000 which as everything else, it varies on the condition and type. And then the fuel savings is 5%. And you may be wondering if, all the answers are right here. Why are they not doing it? And I mean, and here's our profit flow, cash flow model that we created. And we use the assumption of $100 million for seven years. And as you can see, we, we didn't put the whole model here because it would have been too complicated to break down. So we put a more simplified version, including four years and the final year. And this is our model, the baseline model for 
how much it costs to own and maintain a ship. And such as a loan, the loan is for $100 million. So it's a debt, essentially. And as you can see, the capital is 25 million. They're slowly paying it off as the year go. And then the final year, they sell the ship. And as you, if this show, doesn't show the energy efficiency or fuel tax, the fuel is 5 million. And then other expenses such as crew maintenance and other fixes are 1.5. And then as you can see, the charter income is how much they make. So typically we have to subtract the expenses from the charter income, which would net about 7.8 million. And it goes on for the years until we get the final result for 10.3 million as the baseline profit. And SD, we factor multiple things such as days at sea, um, other expenses. And then we also factor inflation because we know that a million dollars today is not worth the same in two years. So we factor that as using the 10%. And then let's see what will happen if we add with sales. Um, so this is the same VLCC tanker with sales, but no fuel tax. As you can see, the energy efficiency is 3.8 with sales and ducts. And the fuel, the fuel costs went down because of the fuel savings. And that is very helpful. But as you can see in the bottom right corner, they lose $600,000, million, $600, which if you're an owner, you don't want to lose any money at all. So what's the fix to this is adding fuel tax, which I can be able to. So the average cost of the fuel market is $500 per ton. And adding this fuel tax for, for every $500 and $300 added, which equates to 800 uh, as the effective price, it causes the charter income to increase because the ship owners have to raise their rates to to balance out with the with the the market, and then also the fuel tax varies on multiple things such as the size of the ship or what it may carry. And as you can see, the profit is one point three million, which is increases what exactly we're looking for. And as I get into my results, we notice a trend through all four of them. Uh, as it, it may be hard to see, but the x-axis is the fuel per ton and the y-axis is the profit. And for the top left one is the sill and duct tanker, which we added both fuel efficient ways to. And as you, you can see the, in the middle is what we're looking for to break even, such as between the 100 to 200 range and the top left, which would be like 150, 180. And this is the exact mark that we're looking for to break even because we don't want to make the fuel tax too low because it doesn't incentivize owners to, to get it. And then also we don't want to make it too high for high tax rates. So we would like to make it even. And you can see this trend throughout all of the ones. We also did sale, the one with the sale. And then we also did one with the sale in Panamax and then also the sale in Duck Panamax. So you notice a trend, the uh, sweet spot, it's usually the 100 to 300 range for tax per ton. So a conclusion, um, why should we care? Such as, I'm pretty sure everybody knows about climate change and it's a constant also under the spotlight problem that that's not being attention to. And if we wanna tackle climate change, we gotta tackle everything that's part of it, which is the, maritime industry. And the maritime industry is has been reliable. And as you may know, people are stubborn. So they don't like changing the old ways that they do. And hopefully that this, this research provides inspiration or even changes such as in EU or the European Union, they actually two weeks ago or a month ago, they added a fuel tax to the ship owners, which the U.S. haven't done yet. And uh, it's constant things which I understand why ship owners don't want to add these things, such as it's been so reliable for so many years, why would you want to change? But all because it's been reliable doesn't mean it's the greatest thing. And 
I'm gonna give my references and then also I'm gonna give my acknowledgments to Dr. Hauke Kai Pao for uh, stressing a lot over Excel, which was really new to me. Then Director Anji for and Dr. Joe for even introducing me to this, which is wonderful. The Marine Policy Center. Um, I don't, for some reason, I'm up here, but also Monet. Really appreciate you. And then, and then lastly, partial the education program, then PEP cohort. Uh, I really appreciate y'all for everything, especially the house. Uh, and yeah, that was everything. So, any questions? Okay. Chris, I your talk is amazing. I like the fact that when I think about shipping, large shipping containers, um, it seems like there's a cyclical event happening where maybe in the days of tires we had these huge sales, yeah. and as we go into technology, we see these advancements. Do you think it's going to continue to track that way when we go back to using these huge sales on ships? Uh, Hopefully, I will, I will love it, but as things, but I can see as more people, especially as in the younger generation, showing more interest in to the problems, I hope, hopefully, soon, so. Any more questions? Yeah. So I'm really curious, I'm assuming a fuel tax would be something that like uh, an individual country like the U.S. would like without a lot of control over what other people do. Um, if, if I'm right on that, do you think that if uh, we added a fuel tax that some vessels might change their routes or change where they're being fuel so that they don't have to pay that fuel tax? Um, that's also a possibility of it. Um, I was uh, I'm uh, kind of push out and do more uh, in depth about the European. Uh, fuel tax implement uh, because usually they're the basis of what we go off of sometimes. And uh, I will assume so, but then also we're gonna have to add more regulations and other policies to prevent that because everybody has to always a way of avoiding things. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. Our next speaker is Miss Autumn Johnson. Hi, my name is Autumn, and this summer I had the opportunity to study coral at the Marine Biological Laboratory under Loretta Robertson and Myra Garcia Sanchez. And I learned more about the effects of the end of the community on coral consultation of Estrangia populata. And up there, you can see some cute pictures of what Estrangia looks like. So why should we study coral and why are they important? Coral reefs have a really big ethological role. They draw a lot of biodiversity. Reefs are used for, um, they have food, shelter, and they're a big nursery ground for fishes. And they also provide coastal protection where they act as a barrier or buffer when waves hit the shore. 
so the waves aren't hitting the land as hard, which is really important in the tropics where a lot of the reefs um, are. And they're also important for fishery and commercial use. Without a lot of coral reefs, there wouldn't be as many fish around Woodsville. So it really draws the industry. And here in Woodsville, we're able to go and collect corals and bring them back to the lab and learn more about them. So they're really important for science research. <laughs> Lastly, they're important for recreational and educational value where kids can go to the beach and see corals and ask their parents to want to learn more about corals and start their science journeys at a really young age. So some background information on Estrangia is that's also known as a northern star coral. If you look at it from the top of its mouth, it's actually a cute little star. Um, Estrangia is really good at calcifying and calcification means that the corals are actively calcifying and they use um, bicarbonate to build their skeleton. And these corals can calcify on pretty much any substrate. Estrangia is faculative symbiosis, which means that it can survive as both aposymbiotic and symbiotic. So in that image in the top right, you see an aposymbiotic polyp. So they survive without endosymbionts. And here in Woodsville, they can live under docks and be completely beached, bleached like that image above with no color. As long as there's food and nutrients in the water, the corals are able to survive. They can also survive in symbiosis with endosymbionts and that gives them their brown color in the bottom image. And the endosymbiotics in the coral will work together and have a relationship where they each help each other out. These corals can survive in temperatures from zero to 28 degrees Celsius, which is a really wide range of temperatures. In the winter, they just bring their tissues in and they're able to still come back out in the summer when it's warm now. And the April symbiotic corals allow for clear imaging. Scientists really love Estrangia because they're really strong corals and nothing really hurts them. They survive pretty much all temperatures, different salinities. They don't really ask for much. Estrangia ranges from the coast of Woods Hole all the way to the coast of Mexico. So for my project, I want to learn more about the endoliths, which are the mammals that live in the skeleton. A lot of research has been done to learn more about the endosymbionts and corals. I want my project was to focus on the endolith growth. So my hypothesis was that the endolith growth rates would be similar to calcification rates in corals with endoliths, which would result in little to no impact on the coral growth. And my study goal was to develop a better understanding about the effects of the endolith communities on coral. So for my first experiment, I want to learn more about the quantification of endolithic growth. So I took coral colonies and I cut them into individual polyps. And once they attached to the petri dishes, I was able to collect calcification data and endolithic growth data. For my second experiment, I want to learn more and understand the effects of endolithic communities on coral respiration and calcification rates. So I used coral colonies. I had six symbiotic corals, six apo symbiotic corals, and six apo symbiotic corals in a DCMU, which is a solution that inhibits photosynthesis. So after I was able to collect calcification, PAM, and oxygen profiles on my coral colonies. So my methods used, I used the PAM, which is a pulse amplitude modulation fluorometer, and it collects the estimate of the effective quantum yield of photosynthesis. So I had to dark adapt my coral colonies. So I'd leave them in the dark for around 10 minutes just to make sure that I was collecting the max photosynthetic yield data from the polyp and not um, from the lights in the room. And the PAM actually looks like that image on the top right. And it can be used underwater, but in the lab, I just use it, I suck it in my cups with the water. And it lets out a bright flashing red light and that would give me my data of the max photosynthetic yield of each polyp. And for calcification, I use buoyant weight to measure this. I took my buoyant weight of my coral colonies at the beginning and the end of my experiment. And to measure the corals, you have to weigh them in water. So we set a scale over a tub of water, just to make sure that we we're also measuring the tissue along with the skeleton weight. And in that bottom corner is a picture of what my coral colonies look like in the cups. So for my endolithic growth data in experiment one, which is my coral polyps, I took an image once a week of the endolithic growth. And from there, I used Fiji, a software to measure how much my endoliths were growing. So that's my image from my first week. This is the third week. And here you can see the length of growth that I had in those three weeks. So in my chart in the top right, you can see that my data was pretty much varied between the different polyps. 
And this could be due to just some polyps are happier in the petri dishes than others. I fed them similarly and I changed the water the same, but the corals were just growing at different rates. But on average, the endoliths were growing around 0.0035 millimeters squared per day, which is a really small number, but the endoliths are growing a lot faster than my corals were calcifying. So for my calcification data, I put my coral polyps on the microscope and I set up a time lapse for it to take an image each hour for nine hours. So I was collecting um, how quickly each crystal was calcifying in between those hours. So that's my first hour versus my fourth hour. And here's my ninth hour. And then I use Fiji to also, oh, my slide's not there, sorry. I use Fiji to measure how the area of each crystal. So in that first photo, you can see on the top left-hand corner, there's a big crystal. And like each hour, that one pretty much grew the most on average. So I found that my corals without endolus were calcifying really quickly compared to my corals with endolus. I only had one coral polyp that attached without endolus. So I need to have more coral polyps attached to know if this trend continues with more um, samples. So for my first experiment in my individual polyps, I found that the endo community grew faster than calcification and that calcification rates exhibited a pattern of higher growth in coral colonies without endolus. For my second experiment with my coral colonies, I was able to work with Molly Monaghan and we used microsensors to measure dissolved oxygen in both the tissue and the skeleton of my corals. And there in that image, you can see Molly on the microscope. So we had to put this really tiny microsensor into the mouth of my corals. And the mouse would kind of move while we were taking the profile. So like we put it down and the second profile, like the mouse would like shift over. And this affected our data, you'll see a little bit. So on the left, you'll see the data from the coral, the coral tissue. So at the top of the mouth, the symbiotics had the highest dissolved oxygen. And then as you went, we did the profile three times in each polyp. We found that the oxygen increase in the symbiotic corals the most. And this could be due, the symbiotic corals have the endosymbionts, so they're actively producing oxygen, which is why that number is increasing as we're going into the tissue. But for my aposymbiotics, they have no, they have no endosymbionts producing oxygen. So that's why the oxygen didn't increase as we went further into the mouth. And then here on the right, this is my data from the skeleton. So we actually drilled a hole into the skeleton so there was no moving around when we were taking these profiles, but the microsensor could be going in like different spots of the drilled hole. And I think that's what created some of my data to be a little bit different. So for the skeleton, we found that the symbiotic corals also had the highest dissolved oxygen at the mouth. As you went down, the oxygen decreased for all of them. This is because there's nothing else producing oxygen deeper in the skeleton. And in my DCMU group, we killed off all those endosymbionts with that solution. And you can also see at 100% saturation, we got 225. So that's when the corals, um, that's the max oxygen that the coral can produce. Oh. Oh. I also want to say that in between the symbiotic and the aposymbiotic, they have different microbial groups producing oxygen. They can be producing it at different rates and there can be different ones in the mouth towards the skeleton, which is why the data kind of is different. So for calcification in my whole colonies, I got this data from buoyant weight, and I found that the symbiotic corals decreased the least in weight, and that my apo symbiotic DCMU group decreased the most. And after a week or so, we found out that, well, we knew that the apo symbiotic were on um, a yellow sponge, and the sponge started to die in that DCMU solution. So I had to redo my buoyant weights but even throughout the experiment, the sponge continued to die. And that can explain why my weight decreased so much, along with the symbiotic endolus also dying during this time. So for my PAM data, I found that the symbiotic corals had the highest max photosynthetic yield, which makes sense because they have the endosymbionts. They were closely followed by the APOs, and that could be the um, photosynthetic endolus creating that um, max photosynthetic yield. And then my DCMU group, after around nine days, 
all my photosynthetic endless died. And that's why I can see a lot of my data goes to zeros. But that's good. That just means that the DCMU was working. It was inhibiting photosynthesis. So my results for my second experiment in my coral colonies was that the symbiotic corals had the highest rate of photosynthesis, and this was reflected in their higher growth. The major finding of the study was that the endo community grew faster than my corals could calcify, but further studies would need to be done on multiple sample sets to determine if this trend was constant in greater sample sizes. And some factors that may have influenced my data is that I fed the corals each day, Monday through Friday, but over the weekend, they were on their own. So maybe if I fed them more, they would have been growing more. Along with that, I did water changes around every other day, but especially my DCMU group where the sponge was dying, their water quality was decreasing at a higher rate than my other two groups. And I think that this really had a big effect on them. And some of those coral colonies actually died, which really broke my heart. <laughs> and then for the coral polyps, we cut around 40 coral polyps and only seven of them attached by the end of my experiment. So if I had more time, I'd wait for more of them to attach so I could collect more data just to know if my trends continued with a greater sample size. And that's really a pretty picture of a growing skeleton on one of my coral polyps. I'm very grateful to many people who have contributed to this project by providing samples, knowledge, access to labs, and resources. Anji and Mo, thank you for choosing me for this internship and giving me the opportunity to do research this summer. And thank you for all your support over the summer. I really appreciate you guys. Um, I want to thank George Lyles for mentoring me, and I want to thank my mentor, Dr. Loretta Robertson. Thank you so much for allowing me to come to your lab, teaching me so much about corals. And I want to thank also Myra. She helped me through all my problems and all questions that I had in the lab. And Molly Monahan for doing her research with me this summer. She didn't have to help me with the oxygen profiles, but she took time to help me. And also thank you to PEP23 cohort. Um, you know, we got through this together, so thank you. <laughs> and it was so great seeing all your projects. You guys did so well today. And this is a picture of me in my lab. Thank you guys for coming so much. <laughs> we are out there collecting seaweed. So yeah. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>
Uh, my name is Jonathan Kapelievich. I'm from the University of Connecticut. I'm a filmmaker, journalist, and now a science communicator. Uh, my mentor was Dr. Heather Goldstone while I was working at the Woodwell Climate Research Center. And my presentation was about the value of science communication to the Partnership Education Program. You guys can hear me, right? Cool. All right. So, quote, scientists must learn to communicate with the public, be willing to do so, and indeed consider it their duty to do so. Now, this was a quote from the Royal Society back in 1960, and the Royal Society is the British Academy of National Sciences. So clearly, this was a pretty big deal. They even have entire chapters on how to deal with mass media coming from the point of a scientist. And so I hope this quote kind of conveys that science communication has always been a consideration when it does come to, you know, just science. And so an intro to science communication, those are pictures of Woodwell at COP, the one of the biggest climate conferences in the world. And science communication is the process of conveying information about scientific studies to a wide variety of audiences. Now, the way you speak, of course, changes with your audience. So if you're presenting at a TED talk to the public, you're going to speak differently than if you're presenting your research to a conference or pretend presenting your research at a conference surrounded by your peers or even as Woodwell does, writing risk assessments for uh, local governments about the effects of climate change on their uh, municipalities. And it comes in many different forms. You might recognize some of these. That's the popular science YouTube channel, Chris Scott's, David Ambor from Planet Earth, Dr. Ayanna Johnson's TED Talk, my story map in the bottom right there, maps, video games, and complex posters. Now, why is science communication important? To put it simply, science and tech play a big role, play a big role in our everyday lives. Everything is run by science. Vaccines, uh, MRI machines were you know, invented by nuclear physicists, public transportation, cars, buses, etc. And so knowing more means A, that you can do more, you know, maybe fix your car, go on a healthy diet, you know, stuff like that. But being a scientist and being able to distill something complex like Sam's benthic ecology or you know Esme's project on ocean alkalinity enhancement. Being able to talk about that and distill it into something simple and communicable means that you can empower people to do more. Uh, people can learn how to be sustainable through education, influence public policy, and overall just be kinder towards each other and the environment. Now, more and more, uh, there was a survey in 2012 that says that more and more scientists are expected to convey their research directly. But this poses a barrier. Scientists are in their lab almost every day and are surrounded by people who communicate in the same jargon as they do. So the hardest part is, you know, you get used to that environment and then when you step out of your comfort zone, you're at a loss for words for when it comes to communicating with the public. And so how do you, you know, how do you fix this kind of stuff? You talk about people, you talk about the faces behind the science. And I quote, Avion said this about Pat, it's cool to see people that are really focused and driven to do something. Here you see other people who are driven and it motivates you. Science is not just a bunch of numbers and graphs and data, although those are very necessary and papers and abstracts as well. You have to talk about people and none of us are born scientists. Everyone was hooked into science for a reason. And so talking about those stories, talking about those reasons, can hook people in and then you can you know explain the science and furthermore equity is starting to play a big part in science communication rightfully so you have to have you have to represent the population you know as it is so you know just as pat does with you know especially women of color you know they've been doing a, a great job with that but so my toolkit for the summer was the canon rebel sl3 which takes beautiful photos a tripod wireless microphones, which have saved my life many times because I've forgotten to allow your mics, you know, the ones that you uh, put up on your shoulder or your collar and mobile uh, kit. You might have seen it when I attach it to the camera. But so first order of business, document impact. That's Blaze on the Kramer, one of my favorite photos. And so we went on three field trips primarily. We did stuff on the Kramer. We went whale watching in Provincetown and we went on the RV Tioga. This is the Kramer. Sam is not hurling up there, but I'd like to think that he is. Um, 
And you know, so at the bottom right, you might have heard somebody else explain CTDs earlier, where we lower a machine into the water with little tubes, and those tubes close at certain depths containing seawater. And then when you bring it back up, you can take samples from each tube and be like, oh, how does chlorophyll or phytoplankton or salinity or density differ at different depths? So we got to play with that, you know, thanks to Dr. Harden to kind of, we also had a class with Dr. Harden where he taught us how to use R and how to visualize this data and put it out in pretty little posters at the end of the semester. We also did whale watching. Also, two of my favorite photos. Autumn is, you know, she's like, oh my gosh, well, <laughs> you know. And we did some more stuff on the RV Tioga as we did on the Kramer, but we experimented with plankton nets and also something called a gravity core, where you drop a core or a heavy missile looking object to the bottom of the ocean, to the sea floor, and then you pick it back up and it comes out with sediment and mud. Now, on to the main products, story maps. Story maps are interactive media articles, pretty much, that contain photos, videos, maps that you can interact with, and something called a sidecar, which I'll show you later. And I did work two story maps planned for this. Is one about Avion Brown and his research on methane fluxes in Howland Forest, and one about Sam Barrett and his research on barnacle sediment on oyster farms. And now I will show you the I will show you the if I can find it. Ah, there we go. Cool. So this is the story map. It was called Digging Deep to Understand Methane Fluxes in Helen Forest. The first thing you notice is that it's a band. Oh, oops. My bad. Like that sometimes. And then I just all tab. Okay, cool. Cool. So this is the story map. Uh, the first thing you see is a video uh, under the banner. You typically don't see this in articles, but my opinion is that this tells you what the article is about. So you get the pretty forest, which is how the forest. So that's the location. You get our three subjects or subjects, which is you know, Avion, Kathleen, and I mean you know, Aaron as well. Aaron was there too, sampling with us. And you're like, okay, what are they doing? And so that, you know, that hooks you into the story. And the first thing you do is you get an anecdote and a video showing what's happening. You know, one of my favorite bits. Coming up is the slider now, a, re a little rehash of Avion's project. Methane is produced in wetlands, consumed in drylands. Uh, how in forest is unique because it has these areas and more, and kind of like these soil profiles stacked up. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Kathleen. But, uh, and so here's a slider, kind of like, okay, this is what Howland's forest dry ones look like, and this is what the wetlands look like. And, you know, it's an interactive way for them to stop and be like, oh, so that's what that looks like. Um, you know, so the slider and they're visually similar, you kind of got a path going here. And the same thing with the wetlands, wetlands. So you kind of get that visual harmony. And then my favorite part, we scroll all the way down here, is the research explainer, or as it is titled in the oh, hold up. It's somewhere here. Ah, there we go. So how do you measure that thing? And this is called a sidecar. Now every time you scroll. It changes, that would be a picture, but right now the, the website isn't loading those pictures, but theoretically, every time you scroll down, there's a different <laughs> picture, and then at the end, there's a video. There we go. You, you kind of see an action. Um, and this is a great way to break up what would otherwise be just a big blob of text explaining research. And keep in mind, this is like after 1200 words. So it's like, you know, like, you know, make it interesting, get to the point. And story maps, are kind of centered around the idea that more and more uh, we've been, social media hooks you with a, with a caption or it hooks you with an image and then you get a short caption attached. And you also interact, right? It's like a carousel. You can swipe through photos and stuff like that. So story maps kind of takes advantage of that. So you can pair cool text with cool photos. And so you might be asking, what does it take to do this? Oh yeah, I also wanted to say, oh, I also wanted to say um, documenting PEP is also good because 
you get people who want to do PEP but are not entirely sure what it's about because of the, we don't really have a website like with a central like media source. So people can see about that. But uh, why, you know, I want to explain the process behind this because I think it can help other science communicators or scientists in the crowd be like, oh, so that's, you know, that's what it takes to make a story. But so what does it take to do this? Avion had three days out in the field I had to do a week and a half of background research. There was about 400, or there was just over 400 photos, over 25 videos, half of which are explanatory, which means me asking Kathleen and Avion, hey, can you explain this right with the time and things? And interviews and transcription. Now, luckily, I do have, there's an AI software where you can just plug in like an hour of audio and it'll tr transcribe it for you, write it down for you, but you still have to take notes. And then also, uh, Sam's project, which was three days in the field, six interviews, totaling more than three hours, and the same processes as Avion, but Avion's is on an interdisciplinary, or Sam's is interdisciplinary. You've got benthic ecology, you've got near shore oceanography, you've got genetic sequencing or DNA barcoding, and then you've also got a community policy or interacting with oyster farmers. And this is the big mind map. This is how I think. Um, this is a way for me to kind of put chaos on a canvas because when you have six interviews with more than these, six interviews that are more than three hours long in total, you've got to find a way to narrow it down somehow. So this is Avion's, uh, you can kind of see more close-ups. And then up there, yeah, so Avion is the meat of the story. Kathleen is the mentor. Howland is where the location is taking place and contains all of it. And then the climate science is a framework through which you look at the usefulness and other research, in other words, and what priorities it can be put to. Basically, how does this matter? Why does this matter? Right? All this research is cool, but how is it affecting the earth? And you know, what can we do about it? Uh, same thing with Sam's. Thank you, Julia, for taking this photo. I'm literally insane. Like, what kind of normal person like thinks like this? You know what I mean? This is like, this is like zodiac killer like investigation. <laughs> it's not okay. But um, yeah, some of the more close-ups. Uh, yeah, and I think the reason, and you know, you, you kind of have to put a structure to all these themes, right? And that's called the hero's journey. Now what the hero's journey is, is basically a basic story structure that's been used for thousands of years for all kinds of stories, including Greek mythology, the Odyssey, Shakespeare and stuff, et cetera. I mean, it works. And so what you have is, I'll use this as an example with Avion. Avion used to play in his grandpa's garden when he was a kid. It was a really nice garden. There was peach trees, tomatoes, squash, etc. And that's kind of his call to adventure, put it simply. He's always been an outdoorsy kid. He's played, you know, football and track. So the call to adventure is like, okay, where does his environmental journey start? But when the pandemic hit, he chose, you know, when the pandemic hit and he had to choose a major for college, he was still in high school. It was like applications and stuff. Uh, he chose computer science for the financial stability. And it's like one day, and I quote, me and my closest family were in the same room and we were just talking. And they were just like, what are you passionate about? And then I just decided it wasn't really computer science. It was environmental science. And so from then on, you cross the quote unquote threshold, his transformation. Because after that, as you saw, he gets into wetland research with his mentor, Dr. Bile, and then he comes here. And the, the hero's journey isn't complete because the hero's journey is your whole life. I mean, of course, there's maybe a thousand little, there's a thousand little hero's journeys within that life, but still, um, it's an ongoing, you know, life is an ongoing story, and I don't know, I just think that's cool. And then the same thing with, oh, that quote didn't pop up before, but, and this is Sam's, uh, Sam's is a little harder, or I'm still writing Sam's, but Sam's is a little harder because, again, you have, like, all these shifting threads, and so what I'm deciding to focus, to focus on is the interconnectedness, the interconnectedness of it all, something that makes it much more exciting to learn about barnacles is not just what they are in and of themselves, but how they are connected to the greater ecosystem at large. And I quote, everything is connected to everyone else. Nothing exists as an island. And it's just all five of the people that I talked to, not include, I mean, oyster farmer too, but all five of the lab members that I talked to express great passion when it came to like it's a, it, it comes off as a little hippie, but kind of like the ocean is like this big, beautiful place. It's almost like a self-regulate. It's almost like its own organism. 
And learning about these barnacles helps you kind of appreciate the ocean as a larger system, even though you could hold like a thousand barnacle, you know, there's a thousand barnacle eggs within a barnacle and you could probably hold like 20, 30 barnacles in one hand. But to think that this, to think that studying this can help you learn about how baby, how babies, how marine larvae move around is, I don't know, amazing to me. And I hope that talking about that passion would draw people to the story. Now, why does knowing the process matter? So to me, understanding the behind the scenes of the stories I read, or hopefully you read, helps me better appreciate A, what goes into science communication, um, because uh, all too often, I, I feel like there's an expectation for journalists. Well, I mean, that's how journalism works and communicators, but you have to know the science. You have to get to know these, you know, you have to get to know these scientists, and then you have to go back and do all the stuff that I just showed you. And I feel like if scientists knows what goes into it, then they can better work with communicators because, you know, Hui has a communications department. Woodwell has like a comms team. So all these, all these big organizations do have communications, but the, the heroic uh, services they perform, you know, in kind of simplifying all this stuff for us is often uh, an unsung tale. And also how you as a scientist yourself can better communicate. Now you don't have to just become a communicator, of course, but again, it's easier for you to empathize and maybe work with communicators to do that kind of stuff. And people are central to compelling storytelling, and, but telling stories that are also educational is really difficult as I've showed. And so my conclusion is, why does this all matter for PEP? So I've explained why science communication is valuable and you know why it matters to me and why it matters to science as a whole. But why does it matter to PEP? So PEP has been around for 14 years and over 80% of its graduates have been people who or minority groups who are underrepresented in science. So PEP is doing PEP is a beacon of diversity and representation when it comes to STEM. And the fact that like it doesn't have a website or that most of its documentation comes in the form of you know director's reports at the end of the year means that people don't get to see the beautiful stuff that goes on here and you know all the stories that don't get to be told because you know we just we may not have the resources or because science communication hasn't been prioritized. Uh, we've had comms workshops in Dr. Ben Harden's class, which is great, where we learned how to make posters and how to use art and the ethics of data visualization and so forth. But again, um, I am the first science comms I am, or my project is the first science comms project for PEP. And so giving visibility to diversity and inclusivity helps viewers or even kids, if they read this stuff, right, reimagine what science can look like, which I think is a big, like a big deal. And so I think that bringing together science and PEP is, or you know, what PEP is doing, you know, all these diverse stories is the future of PEP. And I hope that science communications takes a more prevalent role going forward. Thank you. So that to uh, just rattle this off like an Oscar speech so that we have time. Um, acknowledgements are Dr. Heather Goldstone for being the greatest mentor anybody could ever ask for and for helping me give structure to my, uh, as you saw, the, 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 the chaos that is my brain. Uh, Sarah Ruiz for uh, being a kind of a writing mentor as well. Uh, Nicole Chapman for helping me out with video stuff. Julie or Julie, Julie for graphic design uh, help and getting that story map up on the website, the Woodward Climate Research Center for obvious reasons, uh, George, Dr. George Lyles for uh, helping me out with, you know, or for helping be a mentor that includes Dr. Gerald, and Monet Murphy, can we get a round of applause for Monet? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lab members too. Thank you to Avion and Kathleen for letting me, you know, tag along and pretty much bother you every day. And also thank you to Dr. Pineda, Liz, Jane, who's going to be a doctor soon. Uh, oh, right, yeah, well, and Jane, uh, Sam, and uh, Jane Davenport for, you know, letting me into their lives as well.
I love when you mentioned that people are central to science and you know it's the people behind science. One of my questions were when it comes to like media portrayal, like you know, CNN or you know, uh basic media and how they portray you know climate change and how it's affected people or how it's the, how it's affected people personally, do you find that they don't necessarily dive into the people behind the people that the people that are being affected by this data you know, or do you think they just it's just generalized and they don't really focus on people? I mean, that's a great question. So, I mean, one of the things that mass media likes to do that I've noticed as a journalist is there's a lot of alarmism. Like the IPCC, for example, like, you know, the international, uh, like, pretty much like governmental panel on like climate change, who released like a report last year that was, you know, we're raising a red flag on climate change. And the media pretty much took that and ran with like alarmism, uh, which is when you kind of like, you know, every week you're sounding the alarms on something new, record, you know, records are being broken, which is of course like very valid, but it's, they talk about concepts and title, you know, like these big flashy headlines. And it's not, you know, we're, most of it is because, you know, that's just a 24 seven hour news cycle. There's just no time for, unfortunately there isn't very little time built in for like those deep dives, but uh, yeah, they don't really talk about, you know, they, they at least like CNN and like five, uh, I'm not gonna get into that. Um, uh, <laughs> news networks don't really have time to dive into the people behind the science. And, you know, even more so when it comes to like people, scientists and uh, like executive roles tend to be like majority white men. Um, so you don't really get like that, you know, you don't really get represented either. So there's that. Thank you. Our last speaker, but certainly not least, Ms. Taina Sanchez. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Taina Sanchez. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Miami. And this summer, I got the chance to work with Stace Ballou on my project titled Patterns at the Edge, Ocean Biogeochemistry at the Edge of the Northeast U.S. Shelf, revealed by AUVs. Um, to start off, I just want to let you guys know what we're looking at. Um, this is an overview of shelf ecosystems. So in the first 200 meters of the ocean, we have the coastal areas where we see the beach. And then after that, we drop off into the deep ocean zone. And here I'm highlighting the shelf break zone is this um, the area of interest for my study. Um, this figure is showing the different interactions that occur at the shelf break. Um, we have those coastal shelf waters that are really warm. Um, intersecting with deep slope waters. So there's a lot of things that happen. Um, this shelf break front area um, is um, the defining area where those waters meet. And the bottom half of this figure is showing um, the dominant trophic pathways in this area. And um, I study would be focusing on phytoplankton. So they're the base of the trophic level and support all the higher um, species in the levels. So to get into my project, this is a collaboration of the Northeast U.S. Long-Term Shelf Ecological Research Project, um, NESLTR, and Oceans Observatories Initiative, OOI. Uh, this data was collected from 2016 to 2022 at the Pioneer Array using autonomous underwater vehicles. So specifically, my study area is called the, is the outer, outer Northeast U.S. Shelf. Um, this figure is showing where it's at. It's about 85 miles off the coast of here, and it's a really dynamic region because it is influenced by large scale current systems. The top portion of this figure is showing um, North Atlantic waters come from the north, and then from the south, you have the Gulf Stream. There's a really big different um, temperatures of those waters. Um, 
And then this area studies have shown that there's faster than average warming occurring here. So that's why it's also another area of um, interest to study. And then there's a lot of commercial importance here. Um, it's, this area supports a lot of fisheries and the coastal communities here, especially in Cape Cod. So this, um, this project, this long-term ecological project is really important. Um, and then the bottom part of this figure is showing like the transect area of where my AUVs were deployed and I'll get more into AUVs now. Um, AUVs are autonomous underwater vehicles. They're these really big robots that get programmed to be deployed off of cruises and off of ships and they follow a transect. Um, in comparison to other instruments like moorings or gliders, AUVs are really useful because they have propellers and thrusters that um, make them really fast in the water. Um, they're very flexible and have the ability to maneuver through the water column. Um, it's going to go through a, lot, um, a wide range of depths, so it has the ability to go up and down the water column. And then with those features combined, it provides a really high temporal resolution image of the water column. So in comparison to other instruments, AUVs are really cool. Oh, it's not moving on the screen. Oh, okay. So my primary objective was to examine the relationship between phytoplankton distribution and the position of the nitrocline in the water column defined as where nitrate concentration changes rapidly with depth across different seasons. Um, my methods were looking at data availability to see what data, data was usable for me, um, visualizing that data by tracking the deployments of the AUVs and then doing a pattern analysis by variable. So I'll kind of go into my methods here. And we first started with the data availability. OOI provided this data um, and is now publicly available via the Data Explorer. So this picture is just showing that their interface for displaying the data and their methods of um, visualizing the data. And they have a lot more parameters from the AUVs than I explored. So if anyone's interested in that, there, um, that information is available. Um, with OOI, I did a lot of communication with the data science team. Um, I got to go to their weekly meetings. They were really welcoming. And they helped me to provide like, more context to the data I was looking at. And it was really cool to see the data management side of everything. Next step, it was visualization. Um, this is just an example of a profile that I made. Um, it's part of this project, but just I just want to show it as an example. Um, I used the programming language Python to um, make these plots. And there was a lot of trial and error. Um, I was the first one to look at this AUV data from the six year project. So there's a lot of speed bumps I've even, um, went through, but I had, it was all hands on deck to really help me understand the packages and just learn coding better. And there's a lot of, um, I started off making single plots and expanding to more plots. And then just starting from working with a large data set to con condensing down to 13 profiles that I made in total. And then lastly, we did pattern analysis by variable. My target variables were salinity, nitrate, and chlorophyll A. We used salinity to identify that shelf break front region. Um, and then nitrate is what phytoplankton feed on, and we use chlorophyll A as an indicator of phytoplankton biomass. And like I said earlier, some more points of interest were the seasonal differences that occurred, and then the position in relationship to each other and the shelf break front. So now I'll show my results that I made with my um, Python coding. Um, I have these de deployment profiles by season, so I'll get into that. So first we have summer, and just to um, give it, you know what you're looking at, um, these are depth profiles. So it's showing when these AUVs were deployed offshore in the deep water, they move onshore into more shallow waters, go across, and then go back out. So that's what we're looking at on the y, y axis and the other the color axis is looking at salinity, nitrate, and then chlorophyll A. So my goal was to just identify these patterns and make some qualitative assessments. So for summer, we saw that patterns in nitrate and chlorophyll were very consistent. Um, we see here that the chlorophyll was um, very nitrate tracking. So with this red line, I'm showing that where the nitrate begins to appear just below the um, surface of the water is where that chlorophyll really stayed at. Um, and then we also saw that the position of the nitrocline and chlorophyll were located slightly deeper offshore of the front. So the um, red line here is showing um, where we're looking at that shelf break front where those two water masses are meeting. And offshore of the front, chlorophyll and nitrate were, um, had masses deeper. So then we have fall, and this is an example of an early fall. So this is September, and we saw that these early fall patterns really resembled summer with the nitrate tracking chlorophyll distribution. And again, I used that line to show how 
these, um, they really line up here. But then in later fall, um, we saw that there's not many um, patterns and that that was likely due to storm mixing. We were able to confirm that yesterday actually with some um, other data from OOI. So that was really cool to see that these dates, these dates lined up with significant weather. Um, and then in the middle here, we have nitrate data that was just a little too sparse, maybe due to some sensor malfunction, but um, we can still see um, where how with salinity, there's a lot of mixing in the water column and that, that chlorophyll kind of just stayed on the shelf and not offshore. Um, we did not have any data from the winter. Um, there are no cruises or any appointments during the winter, but I did get some help from collaborators on the project to kind of fill in the gaps for me. But I'll just show you what I have, which is um, the next thing we have is spring. So here I'm showing two different spring profiles. Um, we didn't really find any patterns within the spring. Um, there's a lot of more, there's a lot more mixing in the water column, which you can see that looking at salinity um, again. And yeah, not too many patterns that we saw at a spring. Um, so in conclusion, I just wanted to point out these patterns and make some qualitative assessments. And we came to the conclusion that these summer patterns are more regulated by biological factors. So nitrate really had a lot of influence on where chlorophyll was distributed in the water column. But in the spring, we didn't see that. So we said that um, the physical processes, for example, the water, the mixing of the water column had more influence on the distribution of nitrate and chlorophyll. Um, this was as far as I went with my research, but some next steps and some collaboration I did within the project. Um, I would hope, I wish I could have spent more time um, doing quantitative assessments, but I got a lot of help from people working in the same study area, doing other seasonal analysis, and really identifying specific processes, um, specific physical processes occurring at the Shelford region. And I'm happy that my research is kind of um, important on a really big scale. This was a long-term project that just got renewed. So I'm really looking forward to see what the project is gonna produce out of that new stage. And the people that I worked with, I'm, I'm excited to see what they find in their research. And I hope that my research helped them. And I'm really thankful that they helped me in identifying my patterns. And next steps that I think that could be cool to take is just looking at more parameters. The AUB has a lot more sensors and there's a lot of other things that can influence the distribution of those um, parameters that I looked at. So that'd be really cool to see. Um, and yeah, I would like to thank everyone for listening. I know everyone's hungry and um, <laughs> food should be here soon, um, but especially the NES LTR project team, especially um, Dr. Heidi and Bofu and the OI data science team. Everyone was really welcoming and excited to help me with my project. So I'm really thankful. I'd like to thank all the PEP advisors and coordinators. You guys are really helpful. My crazy supportive family is here. They spent more time traveling than they're probably gonna spend here. But um, I'm glad that my research got to let them see new places. And um, yeah, overall, I really enjoyed this program. I learned a lot. Um, I'm really happy that PEP allowed us to be here and like be embraced by this community as ourselves. And I'm really thankful. And this was really helpful to my future career as a marine scientist. Thank you guys for listening and let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, Aaron? Yeah, so for the AUB data that you studied, um, was, was there like a, any like errors in your data that you found that were really interesting or was it like that's off or something? So, so yeah, there's definitely a lot that was beyond the scope of my knowledge, but um, this was the first time that we were looking through these data sets. So there were a few things that were like, we had to call like directly to the people that make the data just to ask them some questions and get some clarity on something. So I think with the me and Stace, we were really able to help them identify some things that they didn't notice and that would have gone unnoticed without, my, without me doing this research. But that's a lot of it was beyond the scope of my knowledge. And so, yeah. I think we can all agree that all of these presentations were awesome. So I think all of our presenters deserve another round of applause.
I want to do a thank you to all of our presenters. You all did amazing work this summer and had fantastic presentations. I hope you all are proud of yourselves. Thank you to all of our partner institutions who make PEP possible. Special thank you. And I want to give a round of applause to all of our mentors. We literally could not have a program without our research mentors. So thank you all for your time. <laughs> I want to give a special shout to the Woods Hole Geographic Institution for hosting us physically today and for making sure that we had Zoom set up for our family and friends at home who weren't able to join us in person. Um, I also want to thank all of the PEP staff, Dr. Gerald, um, one of the founders of PEP and our senior advisor who's been around during the summer and able to advise students and give us advice on running the program. Dr. Ben Harden, who was the course coordinator who couldn't be with us today. George Lyles, our other advisor um, who is working on the InFish program. And of course, Monet Murphy, our PEP coordinator that everyone gave a great shout out to, but definitely couldn't have made things run without uh, Monet this summer. So thank you to all the PEP staff. Before I let you eat, we are going to do a graduation. So I'm going to turn this off. Okay, we have Jane is here going to take some photos for us. So if I could have Monet and Dr. Gerald come up um, to greet the students, I will read your names off. They are in no particular order because I just thought that would be kind of fun. <laughs> So you'll come up, I'll give the certificate to Monet, and then if you'll um, line up and we'll make sure we take a group photo at the end. Ready? All right. Tiana Sanchez. Don't go anywhere, stand like at the end over there. <laughs> you get to go first when you have to stand here longer. Uh, Samuel Barrett. Lauren Stevenson. Jonathan Kapelyovich. <laughs> It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Wait, take a picture. <laughs> Gabriella Pelosi. Emoji. <laughs> 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 
Thanks. Esmeralda Garcia. <laughs> no, you know. <laughs> Emily Orozco. Destiny Coleman. <laughs> My pastors know I don't like showing this much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay. Cameron Johnson. <laughs> Blaze Miles. <laughs> Avion Brown. Autumn Johnson. <laughs> and Aaron Edley. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think. <laughs> so congratulations. Don't don't leave. Okay. <laughs> congratulations to the 2023 Pep cohort. Um, so I know Monet has some closing remarks that she'd like to make, and then we're going to take a photo of all of us outside because that'll be nicer than in here. Uh, we do have lunch, so I'll quickly just make that announcement because I know once we walk away, that's it. Um, <laughs> so we do have lunch. There's uh, several meat options. There's also a tuna option for the vegetarians. Um, I did not receive any notes about anybody having a gluten allergy, so nothing is gluten-free. Uh, there are drinks and um, so feel free to help yourself. So um, Monet is going to give some closing remarks, and we're going to take a photo and have lunch. Good afternoon, esteemed guests, lab mates, mentors, staff, and those joining us online. It is a profound privilege to stand before you today, not only as your coordinator, but also as a fellow student who once occupied the very place that you stand. As someone who has traversed just a few corridors of academia, 
I can assure you that deciphering complexities of science can sometimes feel like understanding a Rubik's cube, but in the dark. You know, a little weird, perplexing, but exhilarating. Perhaps students, I stand here reflecting on my promise when we embarked on this journey together. I trust I've remained loyal to my word throughout this summer. In my sometimes fussing and late night lemon squeeze conversation, <laughs> I've endeavored to inspire and propel you to become the best rendition of yourselves. In my culinary escapades, I aspire to offer you solace reminiscent of home. In our exchanges, my hope was to be a haven of serenity and encouragement. As I gaze upon each and every one of you today, a tapestry woven with dedication and determination, I swell with pride. Through the highs and the lows, I believe you've not only gained knowledge, but also left an indelible print, a legacy fueled by your aspirations, one that future cohorts shall tread upon. Of course, I do not intend for the next group of them to experience the amusing mishaps as um, we don't want any more bike acrobatics. Uh, we don't want any more grappling with peculiar hooks, stairway mishaps, or even infamous Kramer seasickness. Rather, may they discover the awe of holding a shark, the enchantment of salt marshes, the tranquility of the howling forest, and the wonder that we sometimes thought as a seemingly insignificant barnacle. But trust me, there is much more. For within you lies a strength akin to that of the barnacle, an immovable force in a scientific realm that often fails to mirror our diversity. But today, you guys prove them wrong. As you navigate the ebbs and flows of life, remain as resilient as the tides, adaptable to change and unyielding in your pursuit of knowledge. Even during the moments when life challenges you and threatens to engulf you, rest assured that low tides shall follow, revealing environments reflective of the institutions that have welcomed you. I am absolutely proud of you. And much like the way that the barnacles filter life's water, seething out experiences that enrich you and discarding those that do not serve your growth, remember that you are never alone. The unwavering support of everyone present, both now and beyond your graduation, will always be there. You have unwavering support. We will remain constant, ready to uplift and guide you through life's diverse currents. As you step onto life stage, I urge you to be as audacious as Barbie. The way she amasses knowledge and pursuing careers and everything. I personally want to be tour guide Barbie or maybe deep sea Barbie, but I'm not really sure just yet. But I want you to be as amassing in knowledge and pursuant of careers as her. Or better yet, emulate Oppenheimer's boldness, cautioning the world about the impacts of human actions. May your lives unfold like a grippling movie, each of you protagonists, and remember that your supporting cast stands by you ready to deliver lines of wisdom and support. For those in need of graduate school guidance and fearlessness, I want you guys to seek Andre. We'll get his number from Andre. <laughs> For future prospects and Woods Hole wisdom, turn to Mr. George. Dr. Hardin's oceanographic expertise and the perfect way he layers a scone with just the right balance of jam and whipped cream, uh, that ratio and knowledge is always at your disposal. Dr. Gerald, he is a beacon of resilience and will inspire you to surmount obstacles, creating a space for you as individual to thrive in your uniqueness. But it is Miss Angela Scott Price, the beloved character who the live studio audience waits all season and embodies the essence of this program. Angie is the cornerstone of our endeavor. She has crafted a program that defies the limits of guiding light in moments of darkness a personification of joy and kindness. As a barrier-breaking Black woman, she paves the way for us to infuse our perspectives, passions, and demands for change in the scientific realm. When queried about the Supreme Court's influence on affirmative action and its impact on PEP, Angie's steadfast reply echoed, nothing. <laughs> Fearless and resolute, she has dedicated her heart and soul to fostering an environment that thrives against our own government. 
To you, Anji, we extend our heartfelt gratitude. You have amplified the voices of the quiet, taught us to stride into rooms with our heads held up, and fortified our resilience against adversities. As we, the 2023 PAP cohort, humbly present you with a token of appreciation, it is with the discerning eye of an engineer, our director meticulously assembles an educational framework reminiscent of a versatile set of Legos. <laughs> you do an amazing job. Just as these modular units possess diverse configurations, Anji amalgamates an array of physical activities, strategies, assessments, tailored to cater to the multifaceted needs of this student body. We lastly acknowledge the magnificent garden that you have cultivated, where every shade flourishes, bound by shared experiences. You handpicked each of us to enrich this world, and for that, we are eternally grateful. Accept this gesture alongside the boundless love and admiration we hold for you. Thank you. I can't follow that. Um, I'll just add that I am incredibly proud of all of you guys. You all did. You're wonderful to have this summer. I know I said at the beginning of the summer and you probably didn't believe me and you might not believe me now, but having you here is absolutely the highlight of my year, every year. Um, I'm really proud of you all. I look forward to seeing the great work that you all are gonna do. And I look forward to being in touch with all of you and uh, seeing what you do in your careers and your life. And um, I'm not nearly as eloquent as Monet by any means, but I do want to say that having Monet here this summer, being your coordinator, has been incredible, an incredible experience. It was a job that I used to have, and I can say that that she has gone far and above um, what is required of her to make sure that you all had a wonderful experience this summer. So I hope you all appreciate her as much as I know me and the rest of the staff do. So I want to give a round of applause to Monet. Right, let's, let's get off the stage where we cry anymore. We'll take a photo and then we'll have lunch. Thank you everyone for joining us. Sorry if I roasted the pep website. <laughs>